So, uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. So, on behalf of Anvisa, I would like to welcome you to the MDSAP Forum. Welcome to Brasilia. Welcome to Brazil. Uh, before we start, I will provide you some important information. So, uh, the Wi-Fi is available in this room. We have for the guests of the hotel is the same network. And then also we have the network Evento. And the password is Evento123. So we have toilets near both exits. On the left, we have toilets after the stairs. On the back of the room, we have another exit. You can go straight and turn left, you'll find toilets. Uh, here, uh, for emergency, if we have fire and natural disasters, I'm sure we, we don't have this kind of problem here, but just in case, if something happens, you can follow on Visa Personal or call 193. For medical attention, we have the, our emergency number is 192 and the closest hospital is Hospital de Base. Uh, regarding the presentations, please silence your mobile phone, speak clearly into microphone and turn off your microphone when you're not speaking. Uh, regarding food and meals, so snacks and refreshments will be provided during the forum breaks. Complimentary lunch will be served at the hotel restaurant, so you need to show you the badge that is necessary to, in the identification for lunch. So, uh, I would like to int introduce you our president director, doc Dr. Antonio Barra Torres, for a welcome message. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege, more than this, the real motive of joy, of pleasure to myself being here with you in this morning. I think that it's a good idea to go straightforward and directly to protocol. And after that, I shall ask your attention for just a few minutes about further and very brief consideration. So, talking about protocol, I think that the protocol is someplace, uh, oh, it's here. As I said, I am honored to welcome you to the medical device single audit program and the 2023 forum brazil and visa has a critical role in ensuring that medical devices entering the brazilian market are safe and effective with the global nature of the medical devices industry the and program offers an efficient way to achieve Visa's mission by promoting efficient use of resources in a collaborative audit program with other regulatory authorities. And this app can help reduce duplication of efforts. Through a single audit program, manufacturers are subject to a consistent set of requirements, reducing the need for multiple audits. This not only streamlines the regulatory processes, but also reduces the burden on both manufacturers and regulatory authorities. Visa's participation in the MDs app is, without any doubt, a priority project. The agency has dedicated team contributing to MDSAP and issuing GMP certificates based on MDSAP audit reports. Visa is also working to enhance participation and use of the program by suggesting the increase of the validity 
of the JMP certification from two to four years when based on MDSAP audit reports. Resolution that will increase the validity of the JMP certification is currently under public consultation. The consultation is number 1208 2023 for contributions until November 29. With this change, Visa is sending a clear message on the commitment to promote the program in Brazil. This initiative reflects our dedication to ensuring the safety and well being of the Brazilian population. Thank you so much. Let's keep the protocol in the pocket and a few other words. Um, I am doing my job for almost four years. And a period of time continuing more than up to now 36 years of public service in Brazil all related to health business, mostly in Brazilian Navy, and immediately after that in the agency where I am the director president since December of 2019. I can remember that by that time, everyone in this room was taking care we were taking care of our lives, thinking that the year to come, 2020, should be a, can I say, normal year. I remember that I was getting myself prepared to travel to the U.S. with my family. My daughter completed 15 years old in 2018, and let's go to Disney. And then everybody remembers exactly what happened in the beginning of 2020. I stayed in Brazil, and in early January, my wife and my daughter went to US. I guess it was one of the last trips uh, still made in the, the non-pandemic ways by that time. And then everything changed. And I'm sure that by that time we were all uh, thinking that we were prepared for everything. And an invisible agent has shown us how fragile, how weak our preparation really was. And it was completely unpredictable, completely. In the worst times of the pandemic here in Brazil, it was something like more than 10 passengers' aircraft were falling onto the ground. I mean, more than 4,000 people losing their lives in 24 hours. Millions of people in the entire world. And why I'm saying this? I'm saying this because exactly when we were trying to regain normality. We were trying to start again to live, normalize. We have seen in the year of 2022 a new war in Europe. We have seen uh, increasing numbers of violence all over the world. I mean urban violence. Violence that happens next door. What happened now in Maine, in the United States, 16 people killed. Here in Brazil, a week ago, exactly the same in public school. I guess nowadays that professionals that studies mental status of persons after pandemic are studying this, how it affected our judgment, our behavior, and then consequently 
the increasing number of violent acts. Now, we are facing a new challenge. The situation in the Middle East. But, what's the connection? What's new? We have, we have heard so many times about these problems. The connection is, ladies and gentlemen, that we are connected with the opposite business. The business in order to deliver to our clients, to our populations, better services in health care, better products. We are trying to promote a longer life, a better life, a happier life of our customers. Here with medical devices is not different. But in my humble opinion, and I have said this yesterday to my team, if we keep doing things exactly as we do, we will be in trouble. We are part of a team connected with a huge team, thanks God, a huge team that still believes that it's reasonable, it's profitable also to deliver better conditions to human lives. But unfortunately, there are so many persons in this world and, I say again, unfortunately, so many leaders in this world that seems to have forgotten completely all the lessons learned during the pandemic, or even they haven't learned anything. I don't want to be uh, dark in my words or thoughts, but as a public agent, and I have seen some things in these 36 years of experience, some things that I'm very glad to remember and other ones that I would adore to forget, that we really have to be with a very precise and careful focus in our activities, trying to find new solutions and getting prepared for hard times to come. In nature, when the per Perfect uh, items for a perfect storm are all together. Usually the storm happens. We have the power to change this situation, even an environment of perfect items to produce perfect storms. We don't want any more storms. We don't want to say farewell to persons we love as we did in 2020, 21, and early 2022. But we have to be prepared. Uh, I have to say to you, on the other hand, that Brasilia, our federal capital, is a very beautiful and secure city. This things, this news that we have heard all over the world, even in my hometown, in Rio de Janeiro, unfortunately a very beautiful and violent city. This is very uncommon here in Brasilia. I'm here for almost five years and I don't remember any, any kind of this violent effects here in the federal capital. So if you have time, enjoy and have a very, very productive days here in the MDSAP Forum 2023. Count on us. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Antonio Barra Torres. We will start your, uh, our introductions now. So I will ask you please that uh, just one member of your team can introduce the, the whole team, please. We, can, we are a lot of people here today. 
So as usual, we start our presentation by alphabetic order. So please, Australia. Good morning, um, Tracy Duffy. I'm the RAC member for Australia and my colleague, Andrew Bathgate. Thank you for uh, hosting such a great forum. Uh, hello, good morning again. So uh, for Anvisa, we have uh, some colleagues here today. Uh, we have our RAC member, Erica Costa. So I'm Thiago Rezende. I'm the assessment program manager of MDCEP and also MDCEP coordinator in Brazil. We have here our team of assessors, Mariana, Marcos, Flavia, and Carla. We have also our regulatory uh, international affairs coordination, coordinator Iani, the general med manager of medical devices pre-market approval, Augusto Gaia, the manager of medical devices inspections, uh, Benefran Bezerra, and the Medical Devices Inspection Coordinator, Maria Elisa. So, uh, Canada, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, Daniel Yoon. I am uh, the International Advisor with our Medical Devices Directorate and here on behalf of our REC members. And I'm here with my colleagues, Christine Lecky from our Compliance and Enforcement Group as well as Aaron Hartree Novak, who is our um, subject matter expert. Thank you. Uh, European Union, please. Yes, okay. Bon dia, good morning, everyone. Neda from uh, the European Union, uh, the European Commission's Unit for Medical Devices. Our Japanese colleagues. Hi everyone, uh, this is Kenichi Ishibashi. I'm the MDSAP RAC chair. And uh, in addition to me, Katsu Ono and uh, Hiromi Kumada, who are the MDSAP assessor, are attending. Thank you so much for hosting this forum, MDSAP. Thank you. Our colleagues from Mexico. Hello. Um, this is Amina Shaibu, the Head of International and Affairs of COFEPRIS, the Regulatory Authority, and with me is Rafael Hernandez, the Executive Director of Risk Management, Management of COFEPRIS. Uh, thank you. Our colleague from Singapore. Oh, sorry, I'm Yin Fang from HSC, um, affiliate member. Uh, South Korea, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Hong Mo Song. I'm director of medical device management division in RFDS in South Korea. Thanks for inviting me on this forum. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just would like to ask you. I ask you all to speak a little bit closer to the microphone. Um, our colleagues from US FDA. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Kenneth Chen. I'm the lead program manager for MDSAP. I'm also the assistant director for the FDA's inspections and audits team. So I'll start on my left. We have Ms. Faisa Manucci. She's the international policy analyst in the Costa Rica office. And then we have Neil Malfness. He is the RAC representative from the FDA. And then we have my team of assessors. We have Michael Chan, Mark Henry Winter, Lisa Warner, Captain uh, Kimberly Lindowski Walker, and Jacob Dyer. Uh, thank you. Our colleague from WHO. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Philippe Buff, I'm the uh, lead medical devices inspector for the pre qualification program at WHO. Thank you very much, and visa colleagues, for hosting this forum. So, uh, thank you, regulatory authorities. I uh, will start the introductions of MDC. Ah, I'm sorry, uh, I skipped uh, MHRA United Kingdom. That's all right, I forgive you. I forgive you, Tiago. 
Uh, yeah, Rob Higgins from the MHRA in the UK. We are um, um, an observer to the MPSAT program, I'm hoping to join you in the near future. Thank you, Rob, and I'm sorry again. Um, we will start the introductions of the MBSAP auditing organizations by alphabetic order again, so please be aside. Good morning, everyone. I'm Linda Moon, I'm the Global Quality and Accreditation Manager from BSI, and my colleague Ajit John, um, technical reviewer um, from the MBSAP program. Decra, please. <laughs> uh, thank you, Adriano Muloni from DECRA. Thank you, Adriano. So, uh, DNV Product Assurance. First, okay, Zahir Harbutliv uh, from Product Assurance uh, AS. I am the MBSAP product uh, project manager, and on, to my right is my colleague from Brazil office, Tatiana. She's a technical uh, coordinator. Uh, thank you, Jimed. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rousseau, and my colleague Michelle Greg, in charge of uh, leading the MBSAP certification program at uh, Gmed. Thank you. I am Q. Hello, I am uh, Irene Cutillo from IMQ. I am the MDSAP program administrator. Intertech. <clears throat> Good morning, um, Alex Crosby, the uh, America's program manager, and uh, to my left, uh, Christine Forcier, who's the global uh, medical program manager. Thank you. MCC. Good morning, everyone. I am Wilson Bonato, technical manager of MCC from Brazil, and my colleagues, Gisela Martin, uh, medical process manager, and Camila Lemos, institutional manager. Thank you very much. And NSAI. Good morning. I'm Denise Barnes Woodward. I'm the uh, MDSAP program manager, and I'm joined with my colleague, Pamela Burdett Miller. She's our US ops manager. Thank you for having us. SGS. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Tamara Nichols, and I'm the global product manager for MDSAP for SGS. Thanks, everyone. To Ryland. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sebastiano Pane, MDSAP scheme manager for Turf Freedom. Turf Sud. Good morning, I'm Don Thibodeau from Tubs of America. I'm the Regulatory Affairs Principal for MDSAP. And to the USA. Good morning, everyone. Bradley Chen, VP of Americas for TUV USA, TUF Nord Group, as well as MDSAP Program Manager. Thank you. Okay, so uh, today we also have the um, medical device industry trade organizations. Please, please, Abimed. Okay, Abimo. So Abimo is not here yet. Abraji. Okay, uh, CBDL. Thank you. 
Ok, uh, Gita Japan. Ok, uh, the Inter-American Coalition for Regulatory Convergence. My name is Leticia Fonseca. I'm the Deputy Executive Secretary from the Inter-American Coalition. Thank you for the invitation. And MedTech Canada. It's working. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Mia Spiegelman, Vice President, Regulatory Affairs for MedTech Canada, and uh, happy to be here today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, about, for the presentations. Uh, here we will have a short overview of the agenda. So before it, I would like to, to explain about our remote attendance. So we have uh, 452 persons online now. And then I would like to, um, to know that I would like to say thank you for the people that are joining online, especially our regulatory authorities. So we have Argentina and Matt online. We have also uh, the Ministry of Health of Israel. So special thanks for them that they, it was not possible for them to join us in person for safety re reasons. And then we hope that the situation gets better soon. We, we also have Taiwan Food and Administration online and Ministerio de la Salud Pública de Uruguay. So these are the, our regulators online. Also, we have some auditing organizations that have joined online. So uh, DNV MedCert, uh, DQS, and UL. So welcome. Uh, so here, a short overview about our ag agenda today. So I will start the item 4.4 now, is an introduction about MDCEP. So we have many uh, industries that are online interested in joining the program. We have some regulatory authorities also interested in joining the program. We will have a short introduction about the program, and then we will start the topics that each array will explain how we are using MDSAP. So we start again by alphabetical order with Australia, Brazil, Canada. We will have a short break and then we will continue with uh, the use of MDSAP by Japan, United States, and WHO. Uh, after lunch, we will uh, have some regulatory updates about MHRA, United Kingdom, and European Union. After it, we, will, we would like to see how our affiliate members are using MDSAP. So we will have presentations from Argentina, Israel, Singapore, and South Korea. After a short break, we will have uh, presentations of the regulatory framework of COFEPRIS Mexico. COFEPRIS is one of the regulatory authorities interested in joining MDSAP. And Taiwan FDA is our new affiliate member, so they both will present their regulatory framework in medical devices. At 4 p.m., we will discuss some information about the program, so we will see about some updates, some data about how many manufacturers we have in MDSAP now. Um, so our colleague Jake from FDA will show you many interesting uh, data about the program. We will have a Q&A section, and then we will prepare for the next day. So thank you all. We will start our presentations. Apresentação 4.4.
So, uh, good morning again. So, I'm Thiago Rezende Cunha. I'm the MDSAP coordinator at Anvisa. And I would like to do a short in introduction about MDSAP program. So, what is MDSAP and why are we here today? So, uh, first we will start with the definition of the program. So, the Medical Device Single Audit Program is a regulatory audit program that allows a medical device manufacturer to have a single QMS audit to satisfy the requirements of all participation, participating regulatory authorities. So here I have uh, an explanation about how MDSAP works. So we have the five jurisdictions that are the RAC members that have created MDSAP in the past. So we have Brazil, Australia, Canada, Japan, and US FDA. So we, we have developed an assessment program where we evaluate and recognize the auditing organizations to make sure they will perform reliable audits in the medical devices manufacturers. So these auditing organizations, they will develop uh, audit programs for each medical device, and then they will send the audit reports for the regulatory authorities, and then we can use these audit reports to take some actions and some regulatory uh, actions that each authority can do in your own way. Each authority can do it independently according to your regulatory framework. So here are the main objectives of MDSAP, is to operate a single audit program that provides confidence in the outcomes, to enable appropriate regulatory oversight of medical device manufacturers, QMS, while minimizing regulatory burden on industry, to promote more efficient and flexible use of regulatory resources through work sharing and mutual acceptance among regulators, while respecting the independence of each authority, and to pr promote in a longer, longer term greater alignment of regulatory approaches and technical requirements globally based on international standards and best practices. Um, a little bit of our history, uh, this is the MDSAP timeline. So the MDSAP was created in 2012. It was a working group that came from IMDRF and we started with Australia, Brazil, Canada and the US. So the first years of the program between 2012, 2014, it was, uh, we have developed the documents and the environment for, for the program. Uh, from 2014 to 2016, it was the MDSAP pilot pro program. So MDSAP was uh, created based on the Q, uh, the uh, CAMDCAS program is a program from Health Canada. So uh, we have invited the auditing organizations that were part of CAMDCAS to do a pilot program. During the pilot program, J Japan has joined the program in 2015. After the, the pilot program, we, have, uh, we, we did a study and then we have a report that we call proof of concept that proves that the model of MDSAP is reliable and then we can use this for regulatory purposes. 2019, it was the end of the transition of CAMDCAS. So the, the companies that were part of CAMDCAS, they have mi migrated to MDSAP. 2020, we have started the affiliate membership that we are inviting new regulatory authorities to join the program and it's an extension of MDSAP. So here we have our official members that Australia, Brazil, Canada, Japan, and the US. Our official observers are the World Health Organization, European Union, and MHRA UK. We have our affiliate members, uh, Singapore, South Korea, Israel, and Argentina. And then we have uh, a new affiliate member that is Taiwan Food and Drug Administration. So welcome to the program. And then one question that uh, we always receive from uh, different authorities is how the auditing organizations are evaluated and recognized 
and their MD set. So uh, we have the MD set assessment criteria that it's based on the ISO 17021, and then two documents that were developed by the MD set program to evaluate the auditing organizations. We have the N3 and N4. So uh, the five jurisdictions of MD set we perform assessments in. We visit the head offices of the auditing organizations, and we also we perform witnessed audits where we observe them in action. So we have six main processes that we evaluate the auditing organizations before do the recognition, and we monitor them every year. So we have processes like management that we evaluate uh, if the auditing organization have like conflict of interests, uh, some things related with impartiality, financial stability. We evaluate the use of external resources just in case any auditing organization outsource one process, they need to control this very well. Measurement analysis and improvement, uh, how the auditing organizations work the quality system, how they handle the complaints, uh, how, how they handle the CAPA and perform internal audits. Competence management is very important thing, is how the audit organizations qualify the auditors, how they train and make sure that the auditors are qualified to do a very good MD sub audit and provide us a reliable report. Audit and certification decision is how the audit organization prepare for the audits, how they perform the audits, how they issue the certificate, how they do the follow-ups on the non-conformities. And then we have information management. How is the communication between the auditing organizations and the regulatory authorities and how they treat confidentiality of the documents? So the assessment criteria, as I already mentioned, is the ISO 17021, and also we have N3 and N4. The second question we have is, what are the requirements verified in the MDSAP audit? So the auditing organizations, they visit the manufacturers and they perform the MDSAP audit based in the MDSAP audit criteria. We have developed the MDSAP audit approach. It was based in the ISO 13485 plus the specific requirements from Australia, Brazil, Canada, Japan, and the United States. So our audit approach is is based in four main processes. We have management, measures analysis improvement, design and development, and production and service controls. So these four main processes, we have interface with purchasing and risk management. We also have two uh, uh, secondary uh, processes, that's marketing authorization and facility registration, and adverse events and advisory notices. So about the use of MDSAP. So which company can use MDSAP? And the, the answer is all medical devices manufacturers can use MDSAP. So MDSAP allows any medical device manufacturer to directly contract an AO to have a single audit that meets the requirements of all the participant regulatory authorities about the regulatory authorities, how the regulatory authorities use MDCEP. So each regulatory authority defines how MDCEP outcomes are used. Its jurisdiction in according with its legislation and regulatory framework. So the regulatory authorities are free to use MDCEP according with your needs. So that's what we will be discussing during this day. So we will have several presentations from different regulatory authorities to understand how each regulatory authority is using MDSAP. So, thank you very much. So, uh, in MDSAP we have the tradition that everything is by alphabetical order, so we will start with Australia, PJ. Thank you. Next presentation.
Hello, welcome everybody. Um, this is the CGA regulatory update. Um, welcome to everybody, um, especially my uh, colleague Zoe Barand in Australia and any Australian um, industry that are joining us at about midnight their time. So um, thank you very much for joining. <laughs> um, so this presentation is just going to go through some regulatory updates since the last forum. Uh, how the TGA uses MDSAP in Australia, um, including the challenges and the benefits, um, and also just touching uh, predominantly for the AO's benefit, some changes we're proposing for the audit approach. So the Australian government's undertaking a significant program of reforms to strengthen the regulation of medical devices in Australia. Uh, some of those came from a medicine and medical device regulatory review that was performed in 2017. And more recently, there's an action plan um, addressing some reform changes as well. So I've touched on some of these in previous forums. Um, but just to summarise, um, we've implemented a, a priority review pathway uh, we've established Australian conformity assessment bodies. There's been changes to the regulation of personalised medical devices, um, changes to IVD companion diagnostics, and also the regulation of medical device software. I'm going to touch on a few different areas um, and updates in the next slides. So we had a, a reform project to reclassify certain medical devices. This was um, predominantly to harmonise with the European MDR. Um, on, in November 2021, there was um, reclassification of certain devices, and there's a list of the devices there in the, the table. Um, in July 2023, uh, the Minister agreed that regulatory amendments should be drafted to extend the transition deadline. So the current transition deadline was the 1st of November, 2024. That's now being extended to the 1st of July, 2029. Um, there's still regulatory amendments to be performed. So this is a proposed transition deadline at this stage. Most of the um, devices there are being upclassified to, to class three. Any, um, this only applies to devices uh, that are already on the market. Those that apply for a AICG inclusion now have to comply with the, the up classification requirements. Another one of the reform changes is point of care manufacturing. Uh, this is just an update. So the CGA is uh, focused on how personalised medical devices uh, framework applies to manufacturing at the point of care uh, to ensure the regulations appropriate. Um, and without in introducing unnecessary burden on industry. So at this stage, we've um, surveyed um, activities in certain sectors, in the allied health sector, the dental sector, manufacturing hubs at the point of care, and um, hospital and healthcare facilities uh, where medical devices are manufactured at the point of care. Uh, the results from surveys were interesting. Um, some of the healthcare professionals and practitioners didn't realise that they were regulated by the TGA, um, and many were not compliant with the existing TGA regulatory requirements. Um, the symposium asked questions like, what devices are made at point of care? Who's making them? What are the risks associated? Uh, what is the most appropriate way to manage them? and who's best to regulate. And with each of these regulatory slides, there's a link at the bottom um, when the slides are provided. You better click on that and find a lot more information. So going forward, um, the outcomes from the symposium include a roadmap for the work ahead, um, which will include a, a steering committee, sector specific working, working groups, mapping the existing frameworks, identifying gaps and making changes to frameworks, and then implementation, implementation, communication and education. Uh, 
Uh, another reform project is the UDI. Um, so the TGA has been supporting sponsors to test um, the UDI database functionality, including machine to machine data transfer. Um, TGA's, um, just as a background, the TGA is accepting um, both EU and US FDA UDI labelling. There was a national workshop in mid-2023 to identify any remaining policy issues that needed resolution before the final elements of the UDI regulations can be provided to the government for approval. There's still some differences which we're working on um, and it's anticipated that voluntary and mandatory compliance dates will be known in the coming months. I've got some indicative slides that I'll I'll present. So we had final consultations. Um, the sponsor's been doing testing of e-patient information leaflets and machine to machine transfer. Um, and there's the UDI hub that's been refreshed. So that's sort of happened in the past and now we're at the drafting stage. So the government's considering UDI policy proposals. Um, and the sponsor's continuing testing for electronic um, pills and the testing. From next year, from Q1 2024, um, there'll be an Oz UDID release package ready and um, supporting documents will be released from the TGA including guidances and user guidelines. From Q2 next year, there's a voluntary compliance period. So the UDI um, system will be active. The database, the UD, OLS UDI C will be live um, and there'll be onboarding of sponsors. And then going forward from that, there'll be a 12 month transition period of voluntary compliance before the mandatory compliance starts. And then there's compliance dates based on the, the class of the device. So the class three devices and class two B labelled will be from Q2 2025 and then it goes through the other classes and IVDs going through to 2029. There's um, direct marked um, requirements there. The, the direct marked devices are those that um, undergo reprocessing and they require direct um, marking of the UDI. So the database we're using the Australian UDI database of UDID. that <laughs> um, contains all of the essential information to identify models of device supplied in Australia. It's going to be freely accessible to the public. Uh, the sponsor is responsible uh, for uploading the data and maintaining it. And the sponsor can also choose to submit data for exempt devices. Um, the database will link the ARTG, Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods, and also electronic um, patient information leaflets. Another one of the reform projects is the Medical Device Vigilance Program. So this has just started last month. Um, it's a program to assist and support the Australian medical device sponsors to comply with their post-market responsibilities. Um, so it'll be comp complements and enhances the existing post-market surveillance activity and will include uh, educational self-assessment as well as um, desktops and on-site audits in the future to review and confirm compliance with the requirements. Uh, the pilot program started on the 14th of September, just last month. Uh, TGA transformation, which is our digital transformation. You may have noticed changes to the website um, in the last 12 months. So the transformation program's purpose is to reduce the regulatory burden and make it easier and simpler uh, to do business with the TGA. So we've modernised the website there's future changes that are going through now to improve the ARTG and the search functionality. Um, and there'll be a single portal to do business with the TGA and a streamlined pathway for reimbursement. So now I'm going to talk about how the TGA uses MDSAT. So there's there's three main pathways. We utilise the MDSAP certificate, um, which sponsors can use for ARTG inclusion. 
We also utilise the audit report packages and the audit reports uh, to support changes to a TGA issued conformity assessment certificate or for a new application. And we also, also utilise MDSAP in our post-market surveillance activities. So the MDSAP certificates can be used for all classes of devices um, except for um, class three that, in, that contain specified uh, materials, um, medicines, materials of animal microbial recombinant or human origin. For those um, devices, we only accept a TGA or a European certificate. So the, the class of device uh, determines the requirements. So for class 1S and 1M devices, an MDSAT certificate alone can be used to include those products on the register. And as we increase the classification of device, there's additional product assessment evidence required. So the, the table there shows um, for the lower risk devices, for example, a US 510K can be used. And for the higher risk ones, a, a pre-market approval would be required from the FDA. So this graph shows how we've used certificates uh, between 2019 and 2023. Uh, the blue um, graph is the blue um, column on the graph is uh, empty set. So you can see in 2019 there was about 500 ARTG inclusions, and that's not necessarily the number of devices because an ARTG inclusion is for a kind of device, so it can be hundreds of individual devices. Um, it dropped in 2020, uh, assuming due to the pandemic, and then it's been increasing since um, the use of MDD European certificates has been dropping with the transition to the MDR, um, and the MDR ones have been increasing. So at the moment, it's almost um, it's very similar, um, the use of MDSAT and the two European certificates being used. So 95% of the regist of the ARTG entries um, use evidence from comparable overseas regulators, and we consider MDSAT a comparable overseas regulator. Um, so to date, there's about 2,460 inclusions supported by MDSAP certificates. So this slide's talking about how we utilise the audit packages. The um, when we receive an application for a new DGA conformity assessment certificate or a change, like a new sterilising facility, for example, uh, we first go to REPS and the MDSAP um, database to access audit reports that are applicable to that change. And then we perform a, a desktop audit against the MDSAP audit reports. Um, if we can find objective evidence in the audit report, then that's as far as we go. We just accept the MDSAP audit report um, and there's no further action required. If there's gaps in the objective evidence and often these are sampling issues, so the auditor may not have looked at those, those devices we're interested in or the clean rooms or the validation processes. Um, if there's gaps, then we ask for additional information from the sponsor and we review that. Um, Potentially, if those two steps, um, if there's no resolution, um, potentially there could be a targeted TGA audit as a, a last resort to gather the objective information to support um, the TGA certificate. So the table there shows we've got a, uh, an audit, audit um, scheduling tool. 65% uh, of our certificate holders um, that have a, a TGA conformity assessment certificate, so they're the legal manufacturers. 65% of those are now participating in MDSAT. 68% uh, of the, the secondary manufacturing sites are participating and 16% of the critical suppliers. And the, the third way we use MDSAT is for post-market surveillance. So we receive five-day notices from the auditing organisations if there's issues of, of fraud or, or high-grade non-conformity. Um, the TGA also investigates any notifications of uh, change of jurisdictional scope. So if they remove um, TGA scope from the, the program. And we also investigate the impact of any suspensions or revoked certificates. So 
they come through to our mbsap at health.gov.au email box um, and they get um, placed through to the post market section. So the benefits of MDSAT, um, we've had over 100 CGA audits and we actually stopped counting about a year or more ago that it was over 100, so that's a conservative number. Um, so over 100 CGA audits have been cancelled or postponed and replaced with the desktop review uh, using MDSAP audit reports. This has reduced the regulatory burden on industry um, and allowed the TGA to use our resources on sites that aren't um, covered under the MDSAP oversight. 95% uh, of manufacturing sites listed on the TGA CA certificates and participating in MDSAP are no longer actively being scheduled by the TGA for audits, so we're reliant on MDSAP. Um, having access to the REPS database also allows us to, to problem solve issues. So if a sponsor uh, submits an MDSAP certificate, for example, and it's unclear if the scope covers um, the application that they're submitting, we can go to the audit reports and for example, if it's unclear if software was included and they're applying for a software device, um, we can check the audit report and the, the scope. So it saves us going back to the sponsor and formally requesting information and speeds up the process to get products onto the register for Australia. And the REPS data can be used for post-market surveillance um, and potentially we can look at trend data and other things to to perform TGA targeted audits, so using our resources um, in a better way. Some of the challenges I mentioned, the, the MDSAP audit report packages don't always capture everything we need. And most of the time we think that's due to sampling, so they just haven't captured uh, that critical aspect that we wanted. And the other issue, I guess, is the, the three year cycle and surveillance audits aren't designed cover everything, so the most recent audit may not have looked at the aspect we need. Um, and then particularly for the high-risk products, um, we're looking for compliance with the code of GMP um, and ISO 22442 for animal origin uh, material. Uh, we've also received this year some feedback from the Australian industry and from sponsors uh, regarding the scope of the audit. I'm gonna to touch on that with a few slides later. So this table shows um, two reviews that we've performed of our desktop audits. So we did a review in 2019 to 2020 and another one more recently in 2022 to 2023. So as I mentioned, we do a desktop audit first. The desktop audit's got um, sections. So we looked at the quality management system as a whole um, production aspects, validation, anything related to those specified devices, and also post-market surveillance. So initially we looked for the MDSAP reports for that information, and if it's not there, then we have to go through an application with the sponsor to request additional information. So you can see from the QMS, 93% of um, the desktop audits we did in 2019 um, had evidence of the QMS aspects we're looking for that increased slightly to 96%. So um, for that aspect of the, the basic QMS, MDSAP's performing a fantastic role um, in saving us work and time. Uh, looking at production and validation, specified devices and post-market surveillance, it's a little bit lower. Um, there has been a big improvement in validation and also in post-market surveillance. So for post-market surveillance now, we, we're not having to request agreements with the sponsors or um, other records to substantiate those requirements. So I've got some slides here just going through that process we've been going through this year, working with Australian industry and the sponsors. Um, so just a summary, so we had contact from industry in uh, February or March this year. And there was a few points they raised. One was that the sponsor responsibilities should be out of scope in an audit of the manufacturer. Um, so just giving the background, the audit approach actually mentions the word sponsor about 200 times. 
And we've left all of the information in there because the sponsor has to work with the manufacturer uh, to meet their obligations um, in reporting adverse events and investigations, um, labelling and all, all aspects, uh, annual reporting, everything. They have to work together. So we've included all of that information um, in the audit approach. But we believe it's causing confusion. Um, so what we're proposing to do is to remove the sponsor responsibility content from the audit approach, um, hopefully simplify the process for the auditing organisations, um, and hopefully remove uh, the written agreement annex in the audit approach, and um, possibly you know, multiple pages of, of requirements. So some of the examples uh, that they raised were requesting to see the annual reports and providing the annual report is a sponsor responsibility, although, as I said, the manufacturer has a big part to play in compiling that. Um, enforcing an essential principles checklist as a requirement rather than just one way of um, demonstrating compliance with the essential principles. And having adverse event reporting timelines, um, which are obligations on the sponsor, not the manufacturer. So we did a survey of sponsors um, we found some quite enlightening uh, facts. Some those that responded to the survey, over 90% of Australian sponsors were actively involved in the audits of manufacturers. Um, so that includes assisting them pre-audit, during the audit, and after the audit for non-conformities, for example. So that was quite interesting. We had no idea that was the case until we did the survey. Although we also found out through the survey that. 61% of the sponsors that responded were actually performing some manufacturing steps. So they were performing labelling, doing installation and servicing, and managing some of the, um, the picks and pills, the patient information, leaflets and cards. Uh, what I might do is I'll skip ahead a couple of slides um, and just explain the process. So this schematic here shows the requirements for the sponsor. So the marketing authorization, ARCG conditions, uh, there's some sanctions and regulation 10.2 to include the sponsor's contact details on the label. And then there's the manufacturer's responsibility, which is to classify the device, apply conformity assessment procedures, um, ensure the customer requirements are met and the supplier controls. But this sort of shows the relationship. So the sponsor can outsource some activities to the manufacturer, and the manufacturer can outsource to a supplier. And the supplier could be, again, the sponsor. So we're trying to provide clarity in the audit approach um, for those relationships um, going forward. So the next steps, we're working with, a, we've compiled a sponsor working group, and we're working with them to draft content for the audit approach. Um, once that's drafted, we need to obviously go through the channels and discuss changes with the other RA members. And we need to go through an internal TGA review um, and an MDSAT QMS review. In conjunction with that, we'll compile the, the three training presentations um, that the TGA issue for pre-market, post-market and a, a summary. Um, and we envisage um, that being sent out with, uh, with the transmittal um, explaining the changes and allowing an appropriate tran transition time frame for the AOs to adjust. So we're hopeful to get that process ideally this year, but probably early next year. Um, so this is just a heads up, I guess, particularly to the AOs that there will be some changes coming through. Uh, and that's all I had. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if we're doing questions or... Yep. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for your very good uh, presentation. Uh, so we will skip the questions now. We will do uh, Australia, Brazil, and Health Canada, and then we will use the remaining time before the, the break to ask questions, okay? So next presentation will be on Visa. So please, Flavia, presentation 4.5b. Good morning, everyone. So, as announced, I will present it to you on two key topics today, the Brazilian use of MDSAP and on visa regulatory updates. 
from the Brazilian use of MBSAP. Oh, next one, sorry. I will, I'm going to focus on these four main topics. So first, about the MBSAP reports for granting and visa certifications. Second, about the MDCEP certificate for granting on visa recertification, then some of the visa certification data, and the advantages and challenges of the MDCEP program for on visa. And from the on visa regulatory updates, we'd like to highlight some updates on on visa pre market approval, and to conclude, about the validity period of visa certificates issued through MDSAP. So just before we start, this is a picture of Anvisa's uh, headquarters located in Brasilia. For you that didn't have a chance to go there. So, from the MDCEP reports for granting on visa certifications, at present, we conduct an evaluation of MDCEP reports for both initial GMP certifications and recertifications. On visa specialist is responsible for carrying out the report analysis, ensuring that it comprehensively addresses all the stipulated requirements outlined in our RDC 665 from 2022. Also, in the process of granting on visa certifications, it is essential to include an assessment of the NG forms. This requires an approved corrective action plan from the AOs. For this evaluation, the NCs graded as 1, 2, 3 should have one of the status as pending implementation, pending effectiveness checks, or verified. And in case of NCs graded as 4, they should specifically hold the status of pending effectiveness checks or verified. If any of these status uh, differs from the ones that I've mentioned, we will need to contact the AOs and to request additional information to ensure the compliance and eff effectiveness of the corrective actions. The second crucial aspect relates to the use of MDCEP certificates in the context of Anvisa recertifications. So we are launching our pilot program after the forum for the use of MDCEP certificates to grant Anvisa recertifications. This initiative comes with several advantages including the streamlining of the renewal issuance process. So uh, thereby we are freeing up for more other activities. Additionally, it will simplify and expedite administrative procedures and it will reduce the burden on the AOs, reducing the need to request updated reports and NG forms in some specific cases. So this one is to present you with some of visa certification data. So since 2017. So in this first year, we have issued 38 GMP certificates using the MDCEP reports that amounts to 4.7% of the total of certificates issued by Anvisa. In 2018, the certificates issued with the analysis of the MDCEP reports were equals 19.3%. In 2019, 
we had an increase of certificates issue as far as 48%. Due, this was due to the end of uh, CAMDECAS transition. In 2020, we've got the percentage similar to this previous year. In 2021, again, we had all the same values, although there were still some increase in the percentage of certificates issue, 60%. In 2022, 621 certificates were granted with MDCEP program, as far as almost 60%. And this year, from January up to 20th October, 535 certificates were granted by MDCEP coordination in non-visa using the MDCEP reports. So incorporating the certification process using MDCEP reports offer offers several advantages. Their certification process is designed to optimize resource allocation. It allows us to utilize our assets more effectively, ensuring that our human and material resources are efficiently distributed. We can expect standardized and consistent reports and this uniformity simplifies our analysis, making it easier to review and assess data. The certification process aligns with the regulations outlined in our RDC 665 from 2022. The reports are received directly from the AOs, ensuring their authenticity and re reliability and this direct exchange of information eliminates potential intermediaries and strengthens the integrity of our data. We can expect a reduction in certification times, making it easier to manage our workflow and to meet the deadlines. The implementation of surveillance audits allow us for the the ongoing monitoring. So this ensures that our certification remains valid and we can address any issues that may arise throughout the year. And implementing the five-day notification process, it's a key, spe key uh, step to ensure transparency and transparency in rapid resolution of any issues. So, while this certification process offer us a significant advantages, so it's essential to acknowledge the challenges that may arise from this process. So one of the main challenges is the time misalignment between the certification request and the availability of the audit reports in reps. This discrepancy can lead to delays in the certification process, either in our ability to meet the deadlines and effectively manage our workflow. And the success of the MDCEP relies on the active participation of manufacturers. However, there is currently a challenge in terms of limited adherence to the MDCEP program by the national manufacturers in Brazil. So moving to the Anvisa regulatory updates, the RDC number 751 revoked the RDC number 185 from 2001 and became in force from March 1st this year. And it presents updates on risk classification for medical devices considering new technologies, simplification of required administrative documents, 
and labeling requirements and instructions for use, like the EIFU. And what is coming next? The RDC number 36, it is under revision, under revision, the requirements for pre-market approval of in vitro diagnostic medical devices. Also, we are currently in the process of considering an extension of the validity period for Anvisa certificates issued through MDSAP. The proposal is to extend the validity from two to four years. This potential change is currently undergoing a public consultation process as outlined in Consulta Publica number 1208. And this consultation is open to receive contributions for a period of 45 days starting from October 16th this year. So you can provide your input at this link. So uh, these are all related to these uh, subjects. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Flavia, for your very good explanation. Uh, I would just do some comments here. Uh, first, uh, as Flavia explained, uh, we don't have, we have only around 30 manufacturers located in Brazil that are participating in MDCEP, uh, but we expect them to, to join MDCEP as now we are under the public consultation that we will offer a kind of benefit for the companies that are joining pro the program. So uh, the public consultation uh, nowadays, uh, the expiration date for uh, GMP certificates issued by Anvisa is each two years. And then considering that MDCEP, we have surveillance audits that the audit organizations, they visit the manufacturer every year. We understand that is, uh, the risk is, uh, is less risk to, to extend the validation of the, the GMP certificates. So this is, will be a benefit that we understand that we will, uh, we will have more companies join the program in Brazil from now. So, thank you. Uh, next presentation, Canada, please. Hello. Um, my name is Erin Hertree Novak, and I'm representing Health Canada. I was going to give a quick update on how Canada Health Canada uses the MDSAP program, and briefly go over some of our regulatory updates since the last forum. So, the use of MDSAP for Health Canada, we continue to require that all Class two, three, and four medical device licenses have a valid MDSAP certificate to support them. That includes receiving the license, making any uh, amendments to the license, and also maintaining the license going forward. Uh, holders of an authorization under Part 1.1 are in a transition period, which requires that they will obtain their MDSAP certification by February 2025. We are also starting to use the uh, non-conformance forms, so the NGE forms, and the uh, reports as part of post-market surveillance and marketing activities. So as I mentioned before, we have uh, some regulatory updates. Probably the biggest one at this time is part 1.1 of the medical device regulation. It was published in February of 2023 and came into force on the 24th of February. It seeks to create a permanent authorization pathway for devices that were authorized under the temporary interim order 
to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Holders of the authorization under Part 1.1 must obtain an MDSAP certification no later than February 25th, 2025. So devices that are authorized under Part 1.1 or Part 1.1 don't necessarily don't need to meet all of the requirements of Part 1, except where explicitly called out by the new regulation. The requirements of uh, Part 1.1 are parallel to those in Part 1. The only essential differences is that there are some Canadian specific requirements that do not apply and the regulatory references are different, even while the requirements are essentially the same. So while doing an MDSAP audit, the biggest difference is going to be the numbers that are referenced. MDSAP certificates for audits incorporating Part 1.1 should indicate that Part 1.1 in the regulatory criteria, so it needs to be called out and Part 1.1 is only applicable to devices intended to be used in relation to COVID-19. In 2021, amendments to the medical device regulation introduced new requirements. This requires that there are reportage of, uh, reporting of shortages and anticipated shortages for specified medical devices. Exceptional importation authorizations are designated or designed or designated medical devices. These authorizations are intended to address shortages and are limited in both time and quantity. The authorization is issued to the importer and not the manufacturer. The shortage and exceptional importation regulations are not part of the MBSAP program and do not require an MBSAP regulation. Uh, upcoming changes, Health Canada intends to amend our regulation to create an emergency authorization pathway uh, applicable to public health emergencies based on what we have done in part 1.1. The current regulatory agenda aims for this to be completed within Q1 of 2023 or in Q, or Q3, Q4 of 2023 or Q1 of 2024. And that is all. Thank you. So thank you, Erin. Um, I just would like to say that, uh, as you, you already know, Canada is the only country that, can, that MDCEP is mandatory. And so we still have 20 minutes before the break, so you are free to ask questions. Go ahead, Zahe. Uh, it's very good news to hear about Anvisa accepting MDSAP certificates. Uh, the question is in the scope statement, is it of a consideration for you to take a decision of the devices that are going to be licensed? Uh, Actually, we are starting, uh, just to be clear, we are starting a pilot pro project uh, from next month that we will use the certificates for renewal, okay? And then uh, the certificates that are already issued by you. And then it, the, we will try to, you, to, to see if all the information that we need will be in the certificates. Otherwise, we will need to access box and download the report. It will be a a pilot project only for renewal of certificates. But for initial certification, we will continue to use the audit reports. Uh, go ahead. And there are uh, Abimed, I think, right? Hello? This one is working, okay. Um, about this pilot, um, what are the criteria for el eligibility to enter the pilot program? And how does this work? Um, when is the renewal, do we have to pay the, the, the certification fee 
or not? Uh, I, I really don't understand the pilot. Can you elaborate, please? Yes, I will explain. Um, so when we have the visa, the GMP request, um, then you, you pay the fee and you request for us, um, you upload several documents for Anvisa. And then we, we do the analysis. And uh, so today we, we download in reps the MDCEP report, and then we do a complete analysis before we issue the GMP certificate. Uh, our pilot consists in, uh, instead of look for the whole uh, report, we will, we will look only for the certificate. So it will save, we will save a lot of time to do this analysis. Um, also, when you do the certification request, most of, of the companies already upload the certificate for us. So we already have these certificates in our system. You don't need to do anything to participate to, to the, the pilot. We already have the certificates and we will start to use uh, them. Uh, the, what, regarding the tax, that you, the fee that you mentioned, this would be applicable maybe for the second point that is under uh, public consultation. If, if the, the extension for four years of the uh, expiration date of an uh, visa certificate, if we approve this new role, um, and then you will pay the renewal only each four years instead of two years we are doing now. So, the, but this is under public consultation until now. Thank you. Any questions from Brazil, Australia, or Canada? So go ahead, Rob. Hi, oh, yeah. I was interested in the Canadian um, presentation on the use of MDSAP. Just to confirm, do they just look at the certificates or do they also look at the reports and the NCs as well? Um, so just like some clarification on that, if the Canadians could provide that, please. Uh, when we are issuing a license, we only look at the certificate, so the scope listed on the certificate and we ensure that Canada was included as part of the regulatory framework. Uh, if we run into issues, we will look at the reports and the NCs to help with post-market surveillance and also at times to um, review the NCs if there's a major non-conformity that's discovered by the auditing organizations. But for Canada, we are we only regularly look at the scope and the actual certificate. Beyond that, it's all stuff that sort of bubbles to the top, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I please. Hello. Um, another question for CMDR part 1.1. So if we have um, interim authorization holders who want to apply for MDSAP and they don't have a product which would fall under part one, should then the MDSAP certificates just reference part 1.1? And if that's the case, should such audits be subjected to a different approach? Because you mentioned that they're not fully subjected to the same amount of requirements from part one. So how would uh, an auditing organization Defer their approach if they're auditing an organization who is just applying for part 1.1 of the CMDR? At this time, that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, part 1.1, everyone currently that was authorized under the exception or under the um, interim order is in the transition. So they should all be actively moving to getting their, certific their MDSAP certifications. So if they currently have an authorization, do they automatically, are they automatically eligible to get the MDSAP certificate or the auditing organization continue to audit them to the requirements and would those requirements differ from a normal part one audit? Are you talking about expanding the scope of some, uh, an MDSAP that already has? 
both that as well as new applications. So you mentioned that they need to mandatorily get an MD sub certificate by February 2025, correct? Yeah, it'll, so the transition is happening the same way we went from CAMBICAT to, to MDSAP. So ideally, when you are going to recertify or if you're going in for a surveillance audit, they should be moving towards having their um, MDSAP certificate and having those products included. So it, it, there's a bit of timing going on, but for them to transition from it's not like a hard cutoff. All of the um, existing authorization holders won't all of a sudden be flipped over to becoming license holders on one date. It's going to be a gradual process. So when you go in to audit them, it would be beneficial if that product was also included in the regular. But if the client doesn't want it, you could have both at the same time. So you could be looking at both. The requirements are essentially the same. There is only, um, I think, two parts or three parts that don't apply, and that's for post-market. So there shouldn't really be a difference in the auditing approach for anything that's authorized under Part 1.1. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, please. Hello? Okay, now we know it works. Okay, so I wrote this down because it's a bit of a long question. So this is actually for Australia. Um, you noted in your presentation that you were surprised that 90% of sponsors were also doing manufacturing activity. Just a uh, comment that it's actually very common, especially when the manufacturer is selling into another country. Uh, and service installation is quite common to be done by the importer, not the manufacturer. Uh, my question to you is, other than the surprise of the volume of 90%, was there a gap, as in, were the sponsors not identified or audited under the MBSAP like a quality agreement, or was this a surprise of the volume? No, I think it was a surprise of the volume, um, because MBSAP is, you know, the AOs should be auditing the manufacturer, not the sponsor's responsibilities. Um, but yeah, under ISO 13485, installation and servicing a manufacturer responsibility. Um, so I think that was the main surprise for us that so many sponsors were involved. Um, and that, you know, could mean for some of them, as I said, it's 14 hours time difference to here. So for some of them, they're working through the night, supporting an audit in the US or in Europe um, in, that, in that time zone. Um, so I guess it's just questioning the need for that sponsor support and more clearly differentiating the sponsor and manufacturer responsibilities and the scope of the audit. Thank you. Any more questions for Brazil, Canada or Australia? So Sebastiano, go ahead. Yes, I have a question for um, Anvisa. So when uh, you do review the audit report packages, including uh, the NG form, right? Before Flavia explained that depending on the grade, you expect a certain status. Um, are you also interested in the actual CAPA plans? Because, you know, the NG forms sometimes are not used to follow up the nonconformities. In other cases are, right? So when are not used to follow up, so you will not see the answer uh, to the non-conformity given by the manufacturer. Are you interested in receiving the CAPA plans provided by the manufacturer? Thank you. Okay, so uh, we, we analyze case by case. Uh, we start, uh, because we always have the audit package, complete audit package in reps. So we have the report and the NG form. So when this information is not enough to finish the certification, we contact the AOs to ask for additional information, including the CAPA plans. I'm sure all of you have received many requests from Anvisa, right? Thank you. If, if we have no more questions, we can do a five, 15 minute break. 
Okay, so you will find coffee and water in the left and in the back of the, the, the room. Thank you very much. Hello, so welcome back. Uh, we will have three presentations now, uh, PMDA Japan, then we will have the United States FDA and WHO. And then we will do as the same uh, we did before, we will have remaining time for questions. So please, Japan. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Katsu, Katsuhito Ono from PMDA. Uh, today I'm going to present to you how you, uh, Japan use MDSAP. However, um, please be advised that uh, since there has been no regulatory updates since the last MDSAP forum, uh, what I'm presenting will be almost identical to what I'm present, presented last year. Here's the today, today's agenda. The first it is the history of Japan's particip participation in MDSAP. The second is the details of medical device regulations in Japan. And the last one is how we use uh, MDSAP audit reports and its results. Before presenting the history of, of the Japan's participation in MDSAP, I will, I will explain regulatory authorities in Japan. In Japan, there are two regulatory organizations regarding medical devices. One is the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare, MHLW, and the other is the PMDA, to which I belong. Some of the roles of the MHLWs Pharmaceutical safety and environment rules are listed. Final authorization for medical device applications, preparation of regulatory guidelines, advisory co committees on various topics, supervision of PMDA activities. On the other hand, PMDA is responsible for scientific re review of pharmaceuticals and medical devices. GCP and GMP, as well as QMS inspections, cl clinical trial consultation, and so on. These two organizations cooperate with each other in medical device regulation. Japan joined MDSAP as an official observer in mid 2013, then joined MDSAP as an official MD sub member in mid 2015. Since then, we have been contributing to the management and its activities of the program as an MD sub member. At the same time, in medical device regulation, PMDA have used this program as this program by accepting MD sub audit reports. A few years after joining MDSAP, regulatory authorities and trade associations evaluated the implementation of acceptance activities of the MDSAP audit reports and concluded that the MDSAP audit report had been used satisfactory, uh, satisfac satisfactory effectively in Japan's regulatory framework. Next, I will talk about Japan's medical device regulation. The slide shows a schematic repre representation of the regulations regarding market approval and QMS inspections for medical device in Japan. In terms of QMS inspections, there are pre-approval inspections, pre-approval inspections at the time of partial change of medical devices, and post-approval inspections. In Japan, MDSAP audit reports are accepted for these inspections, with some ex exceptions, depending on the type of product, and so forth. 
This table shows the criteria for QMS inspections in Japan. PMD Act is a law, and the Ministerial Ordinance Number 169 contains the chapters shown in the table. Chapter 2 of Ministerial Ordinance 169 is aligned with ISO 3485 2016. In accepting the MDSAP audit report, the focus is on whether Chapter 2 and some of clause, clauses of Chapter 3 are covered, the type of product, and of course, conformity with the MDSAP audit criteria. This is an outline of QMS inspections in Japan. Upon receiving an application for a QMS inspection from the applicant, we consider the way of inspection that is on the that is on-site or desktop inspection. If the QMS of all inspected facilities is found to be in conformity with the QMS Ministerial Ordinance 169, a certificate and an inspection report will be issued. This is a classification of medical devices in Japan. For class two and higher, a conformity inspection to the QMS Ministerial Ordinance 169 is required. PMDA and registered certification bodies conduct QMS inspection. The type of medical devices for which RCVs conduct inspections are defined. This is a list of RCVs conducting QMS inspections in Japan. Uh, now there are 10 RCVs in Japan. Finally, I will show how MDSAP audit report is used in Japan. This is an example of a manufacturer that has obtained a certificate, a certificate and MDSAP audit report. Marketing authorization holder, who is the applicant for the QMS inspection of the product manufactured in the manufacturer, obtains the MDSAP audit report from the manufacturer and submits and submits it, submit it with the QMS inspection application. PMDA reviews the application and the MDSAP audit report and determines how they conduct inspections, as I mentioned earlier. The conditions for MDSAP audit report acceptance are shown. One, as I mentioned, market, marketing authorization holder must submit MDSAP audit report along with the, the application. And two, the MDSAP audit must cover QMS Ministerial Ordinance 169, that is Chapter 2 and some clauses of Chapter 3 of Ministerial Ordinance 169. And three, the MDSAP audit reports for initial certification or recertification are acceptable. However, surveillance reports may also be accepted. The decision to accept a surveillance report will be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Four, this is a question often asked by applicants that uh, submitted audit report is not necessarily the most recent one. For example, there may, there may be a manufacturer that has recently undergone an audit that has not yet obtained on MDSAP audit report. In such cases, the applicant may submit the previous MDSAP audit report or other reports such as surveillance report, as I just, as I just mentioned. I will explain what happens when an 
MD SAP audit report is submitted and accepted. It can be streamlined the QMS inspection process. First, PMDA basically conduct a desktop inspection if the submitted MD SAP audit report is suitable and acceptable for the for the application. In this example on the slide, it is shown that the design site and the main assembly site were subjected to a desktop inspection. The second is to reduce the amount of documentation required for desktop inspection. PMDA typically requires the applicant to submit the documents listed on the site, on the slide, for example. Once MD SAP audit report is accepted, most of the documents are exempt and very few documents are required. By streamlining the QMS inspection process, PMDA can save resources for on-site inspection. PMDA can also save time and resources for desktop inspections. In addition, not only PMDAs, but also marketing authorization holder and the manufacturer can benefit from the reduced effort and processes involved in on-site and desktop inspection. These are cases where the PMD streamlined the QMS inspection process. However, when we oversight the RCVs in Japan, we found that uh, they also streamlined their inspections through a similar mechanism. This table shows the number of QMS inspection applications with the MD SAP audit report we received each year. Last year, 2022, we received 250 applicant applications with the MD SAP audit report, about the same numbers as in 2021. So, uh, this is a conclusion. Japan joined MD SAP in 20, 2015 and has been contributing uh, to its management and activities ever since. And PMDA has been accepting MD SAP audit reports since June 2016. PMDA sets the criteria for accepting MD SAP audit reports, and once the submitted audit reports meet those criteria, PMDA streamlines the QMS inspection process. From 2019 to 2021, we evaluated the implementation of MD SAP audit report acceptance activities with stakeholders, including regulatory authorities and in industry association, associations, and concluded that the MD SAP audit reports were satisfactorily effectively used. Finally, the use of MD SAP audit reports in 2022 was similar to that in 2021. This indicates that uh, MD SAP maintains a high level of interest in Japan. Today, I provided an overview of how MD SAP is harmonized with Japanese medical device regulations, and I hope that this information will be helpful to regulatory authorities and other interested parties who have an interest in MD SAP. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your very informative uh, presentation, Katsu. Now we will proceed for the next presentation. So uh, our colleagues from US FDA, Kenneth Chen. <coughs> uh, 
Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Kenneth Chen. Uh, I'm the Assistant Director for the Regulatory Inspections and Audits Team at the FDA. Uh, so uh, originally, this, this uh, presentation uh, was supposed to be presented by uh, our director, Cesar Perez, uh, but he was pulled for a public health uh, mission. Uh, so he sends us apologies that he was not here this week uh, to give this presentation. Uh, but before he uh, left on his, his public health mission, he issued, a, he issued me a challenge. He gave me these slides maybe last week and said, here you go. Uh, go, uh, go, go and present on uh, FDA updates. So I'll, I'll do my best and cover uh, all the topics he had uh, for, for, for today. And uh, I'll also provide the use of uh, MDSAP uh, for, uh, for everyone. So on today's outline, I'm going to cover the Food and Drug Omnibus Reform Act. Uh, this was signed late last year. The electronic transition from e, uh, to E-STAR and ECFGs, uh, ORA restructuring, the remote regulatory assessments updates, uh, the end of the public health emergency, uh, and the transition requirements for uh, EUA manufacturers, uh, the unique device identifier updates, and lastly, the use of MDSAP regulatory audit reports uh, within FDA. So the Food and Drug Omnibus Reform Act of 2022, uh, it was signed last year, December 29, uh, 2022, and it amends the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act and the Public Health Service Act. So within that omnibus, they included uh, a plethora of provisions related to medical devices. So those changes include a ban of devices for one or more intended uses. So it overturns a court decision that gives FDA authority to ban a device for specific intended uses while allowing it to be marketed for uh, uh, other intended uses. So kind of uh, you know, uh, use of outside of the intended uses. Uh, second was a small business fee waiver. So starting uh, October 1st, 2024, FDA is going to waive establishment registration fees for businesses reporting uh, $1 million or less. Uh, if FDA also determines that paying the fee for that year would represent a financial hardship. So these are uh, new provisions for small business fee waivers. Uh, changes also include dual submission for certain devices uh, and allow holders of EUA devices of a in vitro diagnostic device to submit a single application comprising a de novo request for classification and a request for a clear waiver. And then the certificates uh, to foreign governments, which I'll cover uh, more in depth in, a, in, a, in a, the next couple of slides. Uh, the request for e, uh, e certificate of foreign, uh, foreign for foreign manufactured devices imported or offered for import into the US uh, provides the device compliance with applicable Food and Drug Cosmetic Act. There's also changes to device inspections. Uh, this allows uh, requests for any records or other information in advance or in lieu of an inspection. Uh, so I think other commodities have been uh, kind of practicing uh, this, uh, this activity and now it includes devices. Uh, and another change is bio-research monitoring inspections. Uh, it clarified the authority, uh, authority for inspections related to clinical and non-clinical studies used for marketing uh, authorization. Uh, Post-market post safety activities or other clinical investigation uh, of, of a drug or device. So this is kind of the, the bigger, uh, uh, bigger change that affects uh, my team and, and also uh, some of the MDSAP clients is improving FDA inspections. So this, amended, this amendment included compliance history of establishment uh, in a country or region and violation history of products exported from a country or a region to a, risk of, uh, to a list of uh, risk factors considered when scheduling inspection. Uh, so it's just including kind of a risk, more risk-based uh, type of selection when we go uh, inspect manufacturers. Uh, it also added a subparagraph to indicate that any records or other information obtained in advance or in lieu of uh, inspection may be used to satisfy requirements related to pre-approval or risk-based uh, surveillance inspections. So this is uh, kind of a huge one. So this allows the FDA to accept uh, you know, other types of uh, audits or inspections in lieu of an FDA inspection to satisfy any uh, pre-approval, post-approval, any risk-based surveillance inspections. 
So Hintent MDSAP is uh, kind of part of that uh, uh, update. Uh, also, it amends uh, uh, the amended to, to include pre-approval inspections as it relates to recognition of foreign government inspection. So also a, a huge one uh, where we start to recognize uh, other uh, other schemes, other scopes in uh, pre-approval inspections or satisfying pre-approval inspection requirements. And then we have the reauthorization of certain device inspections. So device facility inspections uh, conducted by uh, accredited persons. So this, uh, this program uh, was sunsetted, I believe, last year. So this kind of uh, reauthorized the use of accredited, accredited person. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about some of the uh, electronics and transition. So ESTAR, I think this was you know, kind of brought up uh, in several conversations. So this is the electronic submission template and resource. So uh, if any clients uh, are, uh, of your clients are planning to submit 510Ks to uh, the FDA, uh, you would have to utilize the eStart template, uh, which is uh, uh, electronic submission uh, for the CDRH pre-market review. And then we have the electronic certificate to foreign government, ECFG. So we're transitioning from paper export certificates to electronic, uh, and this system is being uh, stood up uh, and uh, we'll be moving to uh, e-certificates. Okay, so this kind of goes more in depth on eStar. Uh, it's an interactive PDF form. Uh, the benefits, uh, it allows necessary uh, details for submission. Uh, it complements the reviewer's internal review template. Uh, so there's more streamlining uh, between what, what's put on eStar and it converts into uh, our internal review template. Uh, it has built-in uh, databases, so it makes uh, a reviewer's job more, more easily uh, and hopefully meeting those Medufa goals uh, 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 more, more easily and more streamlined. Uh, and then on the bottom there, there's the link to the uh, guidance document that was published for, for ESTAR. Uh, again, EFCIG, it's the Electronic uh, Certificates for Medical Devices. Uh, it's not required by FDA if legally marketed in the U.S., uh, but it's often required by foreign countries that don't have an established uh, uh, regulatory scheme or structure, so it allows uh, kind of us certifying that these products uh, meet uh, QSR, GMP requirements. So starting January 2nd of 2024, uh, expert certificates and documents will, will, will no longer be printed. Uh, it will be issued like, electronically. So you know, one, one thing we, we kind of hear about, uh, fraudulent uh, export certificates. So this is kind of part of the ECFG false Export Certificate Validator. So these foreign governments could uh, use this system to validate the validity, the validity of the export certificates. So, uh, some of the restructuring uh, activities going on with uh, FDA, and these are quite quite huge. Uh, the first one here, the Unified Human Foods Program. So historically, you know, we have the centers, you know, food devices, biologics, uh, veterinary uh, medicine, etc. But our field office that conducts the inspections is a separate center. So kind of the first step that FDA is moving towards is a unified center, like a super center. So they're combining the ORA field office with the, the food center. So everything would be uh, within the same organization structure. Uh, and that, uh, would, would, I, I guess, uh, the, the, the goal is to reduce uh, some, uh, some of the, the lag time uh, and also uh, allow, allows us to be more modular and flexible when we're responding to any uh, food crises or any, uh, you know, foodborne illnesses, illnesses, et cetera. Uh, so that kind of had a trickling effect as well to the other centers. Uh, CDRH and ORA, the, the Andro group, the medical device group, is also will be merging uh, next year. So the compliance, uh, the compliance group of ORA uh, will be combined into uh, my division uh, sometime next year. Uh, they're working on the package uh, to present to Congress. Uh, so I believe sometime early January, February, uh, we'll hear something kind of more concrete 
uh, whether this would be approved or not from uh, at a congressional level. Okay, so remote regulatory assessment was kind of a product from uh, the COVID days, uh, where FDA was not able to conduct uh, on-site inspections. So uh, they developed this uh, uh, a program called remote regulatory assessments. Uh, it was a very quick program that's kind of stood up. Uh, so it allows FDA to do uh, essentially uh, an assessment remotely. Uh, it's a tool uh, used by other commodities uh, as well. Cedar um, is one center that's been using it very wi quite wi widespread. Uh, for devices, it's kind of slowly, uh, you know, we're slowly adapting it. We haven't developed, uh, you know, the terms of the guidelines. But, you know, this was also written in the omnibus, and it's something that Congress uh, has kind of mandated us to uh, start looking into, start developing processes and guidances. Uh, so some of the things that we're, we're uh, kind of looking at, uh, mandatory RAs, uh, so re requesting records of other information from establishments subject to uh, the section here, the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act, and also voluntary RAs. And I, uh, currently, RAs are voluntary, so manufacturers can choose not to um, uh, you know, conduct a RRA. Uh, so it's not uh, under any statutory or regulatory mandates. Uh, if an establishment, you know, can, des can decline to participate or withdraw participation, uh, in which case the agency might consider other, other tools for evaluation, such as going on site and doing an inspection. So when may, when may the FDA initiate or request uh, to conduct an RRA? Uh, when FDA determines the RA is appropriate to help fulfill the agency's uh, regulatory responsibilities, so such as any uh, public health emergencies, natural disasters, safety issues with uh, the region, uh, it also assists FDA to conduct elements of established oversight or support regulatory decisions. Uh, so preparing for uh, uh, an already, already planned inspection, uh, following up on a consumer complaint allegation, uh, uh, assisting in verifying corrective actions and supporting the review of marketing submission. So one of the things uh, that the RRA team is leveraging is how uh, MDSAP is using uh, hybrid and remote uh, uh, auditing. Uh, so there's gonna be a lot of uh, collaboration and overlap uh, with, with this program uh, when it's developed. So again, I said there's a draft guidance uh, on the website. Uh, this, this guidance document covers not just medical devices, it covers all commodities. And then a revised guidance document uh, will, will include considerations from industry and revisions to align with recent changes, the Fedora, uh, Fedora Act. Uh, so we expect to receive comments on the revised guidance from industry and related changes and consideration ORA uh, are working to implement this new assessment model. Uh, the date is kind of TBD. So last, uh, what was this year? Uh, the end of the public health uh, emergency. So that expired May 11th, 2028. Uh, so with that expiration, uh, there were different phases uh, for uh, manufacturers to uh, kind of oblige to, to transition from an EUA device to a FDA clear device. Uh, so I skipped ahead uh, a couple of slides. Uh, so essentially manufacturers have 180 days from May 11th. So that 180 days obviously have, has passed uh, to submit their marketing application to the FDA for review if they choose to uh, continue to market their EUA devices in the United States. So uh, the three phase approach, so again, phase one uh, begins uh, May 11th, and then phase two uh, begin, began uh, on August 9th, which will uh, require manufacturers must ensure that they uh, follow the, the cap, or not the cap, but the corrections and removals uh, reporting requirements for the recalls, as well as registration and listing requirements. And then phase three, November 7th, uh, FDA will, will withdraw enforcement policies and manufacturer, uh, manufacturers will expect to comply with all general controls uh, that are applicable for your device. So kind of one note uh, on the bottom, I think that's pretty important. If a manufacturer does not want to seek clearance, 
then they need to restore their device to its cleared authorized version, uh, withdraw the device from the field, and update labeling to reflect the regulatory status. Okay, another, so th I think this is the last FDA update. Um, so U UDI, the unique uh, device identif identifier, uh, I'm gonna skip through a couple of slides here. So this came into law, I believe, back in 2018. So correct me if I'm wrong, uh, my fellow colleagues. Uh, so uh, there was a transition period for um, uh, manufacturers to comply with uh, UDI, uh, the, the global unique uh, numerical and alpha, alpha numeric UDI co code for uh, medical devices. What we started this year uh, was applying more enforcement on manufacturers that not have complied to U UDI. Uh, we've started to do some more targeted for cause inspection on manufacturers that we think have not complied with uh, UDI requirements, uh, and we've issued uh, advisory actions on those manufacturers that have not uh, complied with those UDI requirements. Uh, so skipping ahead, um, so just looking at and these that audit data, uh, over the past, uh, I believe these are the past two or three years, um, any uh, clauses that were cited for UDI, uh, these were the typical clauses that we've seen, uh, 7.51, uh, 7.58, uh, 4.25, et cetera. So one of the kind of uh, things we were looking for from the auditing organizations and the auditors uh, moving forward, uh, just kind of skip through ahead. Uh, since there's more emphasis on UDI requirements, uh, it's part of the MDSAP audit model, chapter six, production and service controls, task one, uh, planning of production and service processes. Uh, when the auditors are writing a nonconformity statement uh, against UDI, uh, we ask that the auditors uh, in the statement uh, write UDI. So when we do a free word text query, uh, it's more easily identified, uh, identifiable uh, to see which uh, uh, manufacturers or, or your clients, uh, you know, have have some UDI uh, or some outstanding UDI uh, issues. Uh, the UDI team also um, uh, 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 graciously uh, agreed to provide any workshop or training if necessary for uh, for the auditors or the AOs. Uh, so just feel free to to approach me, and we could kind of set that up uh, if that's necessary. Uh, so here are some of the resources. I think these slides will be provided, so you'll have the links to those. So this is the last uh, part of my presentation, uh, which is the regulatory audit report triage threshold. I presented on this last year. Uh, so just a quick refresher. Um, so FDA, uh, uh, it's been about, what, two or three years, but um, we've uh, kind of applied a risk-based approach uh, where we considered the total number of nonconformities and the number of nonconformities associated with the targeted ISO clauses. And using those two numbers, we have identified uh, audit reports that we think are problematic. Uh, so to total number of NCs, regardless of grade, plus the total number of NCs from target targeted clauses. Uh, the target clauses uh, are the typical warning letter observations or violations that we've seen in the past couple of years, and there's the dashboard link uh, for you to kind of kind of play around and uh, and and see those. Uh, we've mapped those uh, ISO or the uh, QSR violations to ISO clauses, and that's how we develop this triage uh, threshold. So once it's meet, met this triage, triage threshold, uh, we would refer those audit reports to the device specific groups for review. So. Uh, again, this was from last year, uh, just a quick refresher. So we added the RR uh, triage threshold on top of the five day notice. Uh, and also uh, there's a monitor threshold, which is based on the manufacturer's history and review of the RAR. So if there's any uh, reoccurring nonconformities that we've determined that we needed more oversight, uh, that's a monitor uh, flag criteria that we would require review. So here's some data from the past year when we went to full implementation. So uh, on, the, on the left there, it's broken down, broken down by device type. Uh, for folks that are smarter, you could kind of see it aligns with the device specific groups, OHT1s to eight. So these are the 
uh, and then on the column in the middle, the number of audit reports reviewed, these are the number of audit reports that we've identified through the threshold, uh, whether it's the um, RAR review threshold, five-day notice, or the monitor that we've referred over to the OHG for review. So thus far, um, there's about 70 uh, that have been reviewed. And then the overall classification, we've uh, classified two OAI, a majority were VAI, uh, and then a few were, were NAI. So that concludes my presentation. And one thing I wanted to also touch upon is uh, the agency is, uh, you know, we're expanding the use of MDSAP reports for other regulatory uh, activities. Uh, we, we see that MC, MDSAP is a very effective and reliable um, uh, model. So we're starting to incorporate MDSAP audit reports in uh, post-market activities uh, such as resolving warning letter or entitled letter violations and, and also uh, removing uh, companies off of import alert. So, uh, you know, that's a huge step for us. You know, uh, we've done our analysis and we found MDSAP audit reports reliable. And I think we're moving in the, in, the, in the right direction. And, you know, we look forward to kind of more more collaboration, more improvements in the uh, writing of the audit reports and the nonconformity uh, uh, statements. Uh, so we look forward to kind of more adoption to other uh, regulatory activities. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kenneth, for a very good presentation. Uh, just one comment. Uh, we also, in Avisa, we are starting to uh, try to incorporate uh, MDSAP in our post-market activities too. And this is a point that will be very helpful considering the amount of information that we receive from the auditing organizations. So uh, next presentation will be WHO. So Philip, please. Thank you, Thiago. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone in the room and online. Um, I'll give, a, a, like my colleagues, a short overview of how we, at the pre-qualification unit, we are using the MDSAP report and give a couple of regulatory updates since the last forum. I realize that uh, some of you are not familiar with the pre-qualification unit, so I thought I'd give a, a short introduction to the program. Uh, its objectives is uh, to what we call pre-qualify diagnostic tests. And this is to pr pr promote and facilitate timely access to quality assured uh, IVDs in an equitable manner. So the focus is really on IVDs uh, for priority diseases that are appropriate for use in resource limited settings. So those priority diseases currently uh, are composed of this list of about 10 diseases uh, that are uh, uh, prevalent in resource poor settings. Uh, this obviously includes HIV, malaria, syphilis, and so on. The list is expanding. We've recently added multi-drug resistant uh, tuberculosis and as well as COVID-19 products. The benefits of the product of the program is several fold. Uh, of course, for procurers, uh, it means that they have access to quality assured products that are appropriate for the intended use in that uh, setting, resource limited setting. For manufacturers of those products, uh, they can uh, respond to tenders uh, for procurement agencies and organizations that apply quality assurance policies to health product procurement. But it also gives them an opportunity to review and even sometimes enhance their quality of production, especially uh, when we conduct on-site inspections. For regulators, especially those in low and middle income countries, it gives them a complementary and valuable regulatory support. A lot of those uh, regulatory agencies don't have the capacity or the resources to uh, perform uh, in-depth assessment of uh, devices, especially diagnostics. But more important to us, uh, the people we serve, the health workers and the patients, uh, they have access to quality assured diagnostic tests for effective diagnosis, monitoring of therapeutic efficiency, and prevention of uh, the development of antibody uh, and drug resistance. 
So you don't have to take my word for it. We've done uh, a private, uh, like independent assessment, which was uh, published in March this year. Uh, and the, this assessment concluded that the program had a significant impact in terms of enabling access to critical health products for the global population. So some, of, uh, some examples of this impact uh, included 40 COVID IVDs that were approved by uh, the pre-qualification program. And this approval was relied on by more than 170 countries. We allowed or we facilitated the delivery of hundreds of millions of COVID vaccine doses, especially in the resource poor settings. And that resulted in uh, averting up to 7.6 million deaths in low and middle income countries in 2021 via those COVID vaccinations. For every US dollar invested in running our activities, uh, that contributes to saving up to uh, 30 to 40 US dollars. So um, quite, quite a significant impact on, on global health uh, following on from this program. So to be pre-qualified, an IVD has to uh, meet three main um, hurdles or to jump three main hurdles. The first one is review of a product dossier. In that product dossier, the manufacturer will uh, put objective evidence of the safety and performance of their product, as well as product design and manufacture. And this information is reviewed by a separate team led by Irina Pratt that a lot of you in the room and online uh, know. Another uh, pillar of pre-qualification is an independent lab evaluation of the product performance and operational characteristics of the product. So the manufacturer will send samples of their product uh, to uh, a lab and the lab will perform uh, that evaluation. And then we also perform manufacturing site inspection or, or inspections to assess compliance with all applicable clauses of 13485 and our WHO specific requirements. And when we're on site, we also verify the uh, product dossier information that was submitted by the manufacturer to our dossier assessment team. So I'm part of that uh, last team, the uh, site inspection team. So this team is called inspection services. Uh, we take a risk-based approach to our activities. We look at uh, several factors to decide how we are gonna inspect. Uh, these include compliance history, post-market surveillance data, whether the manufacturer has submitted change requests, their sale volumes, the type of product they manufacture and so on. We also try to optimize our limited resources, both uh, human and financial. I'm currently uh, the only diagnostics inspector in the program, so um, I'm trying my best to uh, leverage uh, recent stringent regulatory authority audits, and that's exactly where the MDSAP program comes in. Uh, I also try to maximize the uh, inspections by look at, uh, looking at other sites in the region. If I'm going to a part of the world, is there any other sites in that part of the world that I could inspect at the same time? The format uh, our inspection take uh, can be uh, only two type at the moment. It's either fully remote uh, using a desk assessment. Uh, it's typically done by one lead inspector, but it can be delegated to uh, colleagues, including external subject matter experts, or fully on site. And this typically uh, takes uh, three days for one lead inspector and one co-inspector. Obviously it can be a bit shorter or a bit longer, uh, depending on the risk. The criteria, as I've alluded to, are all applicable clauses of the 13485 standard, our WHO specific requirements, which are outlined in the technical guidance series and the technical specification series. But of course, of the uh, company's own requirements are also uh, criteria to those inspections. We use the N19 guidance document to grade our non-conformities uh, and use the MDS SAP uh, report template and NGE form. Our frequency uh, reinspection cycle is three to five years, and of course it can be adjusted based on risk. 
So how do we at Inspection Services use MDSAP? We uh, first identify low risk sites. So for us, it means sites that have a good compliance history uh, within the program, um, sites that have unremarkable post-market surveillance data, uh, small sale volumes, and so on. And we, uh, we would approach those sites uh, to propose a desk assessment in your of an on-site inspection. So this desk assessment will use objective evidence of compliance with our audit criteria, and it must include a recent stringent regulatory authority audit report. Uh, and for IVDs, it's specifically an MDSAP report. So we obtain that MDSAP report from the manufacturer and we review it. Uh, first, we look at the date of inspection. It has to be within uh, three years of our desk assessment to be considered uh, representative of current practices at this site. We look at the scope uh, of the MDSAP report in terms of uh, the site that were inspected, but also, of course, the product, the areas of the QMS that were inspected by our uh, MDSAP colleagues and the documents that they reviewed. Then we um, decide whether we can leverage the report to inform our own uh, decision. It's either the report can be used in lieu of an on-site inspection, and therefore we adopt the conclusions of the MDSAP report, or we cannot use uh, this uh, inspection report, MDSAP inspection report, and we have to go on-site. Having said that, uh, we would um, be partly guided by the MDSAP report in our on-site inspection. So obviously, like everyone, uh, we're trying to reduce um, duplication uh, using those MDSAP reports, which means that if we go on-site, uh, we should go on-site when um, uh, MDSAP hasn't covered those sites. And that's exactly what happened in 2023. There's been virtually no dupli duplication for on-site inspections. So we're, we're a relatively small program. Remember, this is not all medical devices. It's only IVDs. So we currently have 68 manufacturing sites in our pre-qualification portfolio, uh, a total of 92 if we consider the ones that are currently applying for the program, but 68 are pre-qualified. And 25% are MDSAP, 25 sorry, are MDSAP certified. In 2023, we've conducted 26 on-site inspections, and only four of those, so about 15%, were MDSAP certified sites. But those four, one was new to us, to our program, so we had to go on-site because it was our first inspection. Another site had applied for a change request, and during the review of this change request, we had um, we identified some issues, so we wanted to go on site and verify effective implementation of the change. And the two other sites that were um, MDSAP certified sites were close to non MDSAP certified site that we had to go and visit. So, as I said, when we tried to optimize resources, we just visited those sites. But the uh, avoiding of duplication also considers desk assessment, where we must uh, do our best to leverage MDSAP reports. So in 2023, we performed two desk assessments for IVDs. 100% of those were based on uh, MDSAP reports, and 100% of those uh, reports were accepted in lieu of on-site inspection. So if you consider that uh, each inspection cost the program about 30,000 uh, US. Uh, we uh, save, even if, if it was just two inspection reports, we save about 60,000 US dollars uh, based on those two reports. Because um, I remember you, or remind you that the, um, the program uh, is free for manufacturers for IVDs. So apart from this uh, financial advantage of leveraging MDSAP reports, uh, obviously, it avoids duplication for the manufacturing side or sites, but also for us, inspection services, and we can focus our limited resources on other activities. It informs our decision-making process to go on-site or not. If we decide not to go on-site, of course, it's cost-saving, as, as I've just alluded to. But if we decide that we have to go on-site because we can't leverage the MDSAP report, 
it still guides some somehow our on-site inspection. And on a more logistical aspects, the NGE and report template that were um, uh, adapted to our own requirements uh, facilitate our reporting. Of course, we have challenges. Some of them are shared with uh, some of my colleagues that have presented before me. We uh, find that sometimes the reports are older than three years and therefore uh, they're outside of our procedures because they're not representative of current practice. So we can't leverage those, unfortunately. It's, the reports not always cover the product or products within our scope. Uh, having said that, if uh, there's indication in the MDSAP report that the manufacturing process and the infrastructure used uh, are similar, if not identical, between the products in the scope of the MDSAP report and the products in our scope, then we could still leverage the MDSAP report. Those MDSAP reports rarely cover some aspects that are specifically important to pre-qualification. Uh, I'll remind you that we uh, are mainly focused on resource poor settings. So aspects like usability. Some of our end users are illiterate, uh, so this is a key factor to us. Stability. Uh, some of those IVDs will be uh, shipped to central medical stores, which could be a shipping container sitting in a field uh, at 40 degrees. Uh, so this is also specifically important for us. And post-market surveillance specific to low and middle income countries. Uh, sometimes if manufacturers only have a paid number to uh, uh, collect feedback, we don't, we don't consider this uh, acceptable uh, simply because our end users don't have financial means to pay uh, to call a paid number. So obviously these are rarely covered by MDSAP reports. And understandably, so uh, MDSAP report never cover our WHO specific requirements, but that's, that's understood. We have um, this year used uh, an MDSAP inspector as a desk assessor. I believe it's been a mutually beneficial experience, and this is uh, where I make an official call for additional interest uh, to any of you in the room or online to join us as desk assessors or even co-inspectors for on-site inspections. We are um, always on the lookout for uh, people to uh, help us and assist with the program. So if you're interested, please uh, shoot me a, an email or come and talk to me at the break. We are interested also in the discussions that MDSEP is having regarding the, re the revision of the MG and the NC grading approach. Uh, because we need to align with other colleagues, but also uh, staying relevant to our specificities. A quick uh, regulatory update. The first one, uh, a bit like my FDA colleagues, is the transition from uh, emergency use listing to pre-qualification for the COVID IVD products. Um, the change is basically is that uh, as opposed to uh, EUL, Pre-qualification will require an on-site inspection as well as an independent performance evaluation. You may remember these uh, two out of the three pillars uh, for pre-qualification, um, as well as a comprehensive performance evaluation based on our technical specification series. So we will not extend EUL beyond January next year. Uh, so we've asked any manufacturer that was interested in having their COVID IVDs pre-qualified to apply before the end of the year. Another update is that uh, January next year, we will launch the electronic pre-qualification system or EPQS, which is an electronic platform for processing pre-qualification information. Uh, users of that platform uh, will be obviously internal users, but also manufacturers national regulatory authorities, as well as other stakeholders. The, the main goal here is to improve the uh, usability of the program, its transparency. It will be very useful for us in terms of reporting, and we hope it will increase the efficiency of the program so that we can better meet our mandate to provide uh, timely uh, and e equitable access to quality medical products. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Philip, for the very informative imp uh, presentation. So I'm happy to see that MDSAP is being used by such an important program like the IVD pre-qualification. So now we have time for questions for um, Japan, US, and, w and WHO. Go ahead, IMQ. So can you hear? Okay, perfect. Well, uh, I have a question for PMDA. Um, well, how is PMDA managing or plans to manage QMS audit uh, done to the manufacturer authorization holder, marketing, sorry, authorization holder, if the manufacturer, let's say they, they refer to, already holds an MSAP certificate and MSAP report, or is not relevant at all? So um, our quality management system inspection uh, is based on the application. And the manufacturer, uh, precisely speaking, the marketing authorization holder can choose whether they use the outcome of the MD sub or they use um, kind of documentation for the inspection. So um, PMDA is not actively con controlling or confirming whether the site being audited has an uh, MD sub certificate or not. So it's kind of a uh, responsibility of the marketing authorization holders uh, that uh, whether the dis decision of whether using of MD sub or not is the decision of the marketing authorization holder. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Next, please. We still have fifteen minutes. Go ahead, Rob. Thanks, Philip. I was interested in your presentation. It's very good. Um, one thing that we struggle with in the UK, and I think maybe in the EU, is is identifying suitable laboratories for like batch verification of IVDs. So I, I was interested to hear that you do independent testing of of IVDs that are included in the pre-qualification process. Um, how do you go about selecting those laboratories? Uh, thanks for the question. So this is uh, under the uh, mandate of uh, Irena Pratt's team, the dossier assessment team. So I'll do my best to answer, but uh, may not be 100% accurate. Um, so recently we've changed the, the, the process. Uh, initially it was that we, WHO, would select the lab and the manufacturer would send the um, samples directly to the lab that we had selected. Now we have a list of um, labs that the manufacturer can choose from. So we can still manage the evaluation or they can directly approach the labs and, and do it uh, themselves. Now to more directly answer your question is how those labs are selected. They're usually national reference labs and there are uh, protocols for each product type that are shared uh, among all those national reference labs or all the labs in the list so that we certainly use the same specimens, the same protocols, the same data analysis approaches so that they can be compared regardless of which uh, evaluation lab is chosen by us or the manufacturer.
Uh, any more questions? So, okay, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Linda. Yes, I have a question. Um, are the IVD diagnostic tests the only uh, devices subject to pre-qualification or are there other type of medical devices? Yes, so at the moment it's only IVDs, but we're expanding the list and uh, we will soon introduce glucose meters and uh, hemoglobin meters as well. Um, uh, in, as part of that really true, there's also um, a program that looks at uh, cold chain for vaccines, so uh, qualifying uh, you know, fridges, for example, uh, as well as injection devices, but uh, it's separate from pre-qualification. For pre-qualification, it's IVDs, but we're expanding to glucose meters and hemoglobin meters. Uh, thank you. Any more questions? Sorry, another device is also um, G6PD, uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase um, measurement devices. So they also, they, they look a bit like a glucose meter. Um, so they, they're already in the scope. Okay, uh, we received some questions here uh, from people that are online, but I think these questions are more related uh, for tomorrow's topics. Uh, we are receiving questions uh, regarding the affiliate membership and regarding the um, possibility to no new AOs join the program. So um, just to inform you that these topics will be addressed tomorrow, so we will answer these questions for sure. If we have no more questions, I think we have 10 minutes left, we can uh, go for lunch and then we come back at 1.20. One and a half hour, we'll thank you very much. And the lunch will be served here. You can use the back door and go straight, straight or use the stairs. Uh, you just need to show you the badge in the restaurant and then lunch will be included. Uh, but before lunch, I would like to invite you for the, our official photo of the group. So it can be a, a good gift for us. And then uh, we will take the, the, the picture here in the, this ramp that we have here in the back door. So uh, you can all join us for the photo. Thank you very much. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Uh, we will start with the presentation of our official observer, United Kingdom. Please, Rob from MHRA. Good, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all had a good lunch. Um, my name is Rob Higgins from the MHRA. Um, my current responsibilities involve uh, the designation and monitoring of the UK approved bodies that have been designated since Brexit. So that involves head office. It's very similar to the MDSAP pr approach where we do head office audits and we do witness audits. And also I'm involved in direct inspections of medical device manufacturers as well. So before I go on to the changes, I'd just like to give a bit of background to what's happened since Brexit really. So when Brexit came in at the end of 2020, UK had to have put in place its own medical device regulations. So basically, we did have some regulations in place which date back to 2002. But what we did do is add additional requirements into legislation so that um, manufacturers and uh, manufacturers could um, apply for what's known as a UK CA um, accreditation. And um, based on that, manufacturers at the moment can apply UKCA markings to their devices if they've had approval from a UK approved body. 
Now, in the meantime, that's cool, obviously because there's, it takes quite a long time, as everybody knows, to designate approved bodies. We put in some pro, pro, we put in programs to um, allow a long transition period. So I'll just go into the um, changes that we're we're currently making. Now, I've only got 15 minutes, and it could I could take all day doing this, but I've only got 15 minutes, so I'll, I'll try and summarise it as best best I can. So the current regulations are basically based on the old European directives. So that's the current UK legislation. Seems to have a problem. So basically, our vision for the future is to ensure that the UK becomes an even greater place to develop, manufacture and supply products. And basically, we want to ensure that we've got continued access to safe medical devices. And that's the key. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's patient safety that's most important to us. So that, that's, that's the key vision from us. So I just want to go into a little bit of detail about the future regulatory framework. Um, in, in order to enable medical devices to remain on the market, we put in some regulations which apply some transition um, provisions for general devices running up until 30th of June 2030. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on that in a minute. One of the areas that we've been a little bit concerned about in the past is post-market surveillance and the level of detail that's in the current regulations and um, directives. So we want to bring forward those requirements earlier before we um, fully put in place our new regulations. So we're quite we're quite, we're, we're quite keen on putting in some more um, uh, developed post-market surveillance requirements. And I'll go into those in a little bit more detail. Okay, so for future regulation, it will be split across a number of statutory instruments. So there'll be a number of new regulations coming into place. And basically, the first um, statutory instrument that we'll put in place in terms of the regulations will be based on... Um, Will, sorry, will be coming into force in about ju middle of 2025. So that in that regulation, what we've done is we, we did issue a consultation paper back in 2021, and basically um, to all stakeholders, we got a massive response, and basically the government responded to those um, questions that were raised. So we're going to be framing our new regulations around around that response that from the government that came out as a result of the consultation. And included in that response, government response, that we've got support from the ministers, is that MDSAT would be one of the um, requirements that we would add into our new regulations. So that's what in the future we will be including MDSAT. In addition to that, it also covers international recognition. So in the future, we will also be um, taking on board some um, approvals from other regulators um, to make the process a little bit easier. So there will be a number of routes to getting on the UK market in the future. Uh, there will be some additional statutory instruments based on things like fees and, and enforcement and that sort of thing. And also com Brexit's complicated the situation in Northern Ireland and I won't go into too much detail on that but there will be an update on the in vitro diagnostic regulations to cover Northern Ireland, which still allow, still need to meet the European requirements. So I'll just go in briefly on the transition arrangements for CE marking, because as I said, it's really important to us that devices remain on the on the UK market. So basically what we've done, we've introduced measures um, to extend the acceptance of CE mark medical devices on the Great Britain market beyond 30th of June. Uh, 2023, because that was the deadline for when we would be accepting CMARC devices. And basically, the latest end date now is 2030 in June. So basically, as I, as I keep explaining, our, our main concern for patient safety, we do want medical devices to remain on the market. And as I said before, we hope to get some new regulations in place by July 2025.
So this is a bit of a busy slide, but basically it provides, it's basically based on the European transition periods that they've recently put into place in terms of all the different classes of medical devices. So as you can see from that, it, it, it mirrors the um, European um, transition periods, but obviously will be accepting um, EUR, MDR certifications up until the 30th of June 2030. So that should allow um, manufacturers plenty of time to obtain UK CA markings. So just to clarify that, we've currently got um, seven UK approved bodies that are under the existing regulations. And we've got many more applications um, at the moment that are ongoing. So hopefully by June 2030, we'll have sufficient um, capacity of UK approved bodies to be able to apply the CE marking to medical devices in the, in the UK. This next slide is similar. It covers the um, transition period for IVDs. And again, the um, period for extension is up to the 30th of June 2030. There is a deliberate mistake in this, <laughs> this slide, which I, I only re realized this morning. And that's the fact that for class um, C devices, IVDs, the European transition period um, is May 2026. And for class B devices, the transition period is for May 2027. So as I said earlier, the, one of our main concerns is, is, is we want to get this in place earlier is post-market surveillance activities. So we think that's a really important part of the regulations that need to be strengthened. And essentially the um, regulations are now published on the WHO um, website in terms of asking for um, feedback on those. And we should be able to, I think we're laying those regulations in Parliament early in 2024, and they should come into place in the middle of 2024. So just to give a bit of background, under the current UK medical device regulations, there are limited provisions that relate to post-market surveillance. And basically, the regulatory requirements are complemented by the harmonised standards, mainly ISO 14971, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, and obviously some elements in 13485. The vigilance requirements that we currently use are set out in the European Guidance MedDev 2.1.1 Revision 8. And that basically post-market surveillance has there's been a real lack of consistency um, uh, among manufacturers as to how they handle post-market surveillance, which we think is a really important element. So what we want to do, we want to create better harmonization across the industry. Um, introduce more stringent PMS requirements that reflect the um, risk classification of the device, uh, increase scrutiny and regulatory oversight, enhance reporting obligations, and improve coordination and collaboration between manufacturers, approved body, and the Secretary of State. So basically, it's, it's really trying to harmonize things, and we're trying to put in um, regulations which, which tighten up the PMS requirements in the UK. So I, I'm not going to go into detail in, in this because I'm not an expert in this particular area, but there will be improved requirements on the PMS system and PMS plan, um, further information on how to further regulations on preventive and corrective actions. Um, vigilance reporting will be more to bring it more in line with the reporting timelines in Europe. Um, more information on how field safety corrective actions and field safety notices should be produced and PMS reports and periodic safety update reporting. And for the higher risk devices, we'll want more um, frequent feedback on PSURs. And the other important area is in, in identifying and improving the trend reporting requirements in the current regulations. So that's hopefully that's within my time frame. And thank you for listening. And if anybody's got any questions, then I'm more than happy to answer them if I can. Uh, thank you, Rob. So I think we will have uh, one presentation from European Union, and then we will have some time for answer for for question and answer for both. So uh, please, Nada from European Union. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
First of all, thank you, Rob, for presenting on the transitional provisions because uh, I intentionally did not put them in my slides, but it's good to give everyone back a reminder of uh, the various transitional provisions that we have under both of our uh, regulations on medical devices and in vitro diagnostics. So as Rob mentioned, uh, there we have identical uh, requirements for various classes of devices now. So um, my presentation today will focus, uh, will give a high level overview of the EU market. It's one of the standard slides that we always uh, start off our presentations with. Uh, the regulatory changes, if you catch me saying new regulations, please stop me because they're not new anymore. It's been since 2017. And uh, I will also cover some of the activities that we are currently uh, undertaking for increasing notified body capacity and readiness of manufacturers. Um, some of the projects that are currently ongoing, uh, you're not misreading it. It is called NoboCop, not RoboCop. So uh, it's a, an activity, a, a big project on increasing and training of notified bodies and training of personnel for working with notified bodies and manufacturers in the future, and briefly cover some of the MDSAP related activities. 2.3 is supposed to be on standardization of fees. Uh, apologies, it somehow didn't make it into this uh, overview. So you're probably familiar with the EU single market for medical devices. It covers the market of 27 uh, member states uh, of the EU as well as uh, countries of the European Economic Area, Norway, Liechtenstein, and Iceland. And we have a customs union agreement with Turkey, meaning that their notified bodies as well uh, and medical devices coming from Turkey can freely circulate on the European market. Um, once again, one of our standard slides, uh, since 2017, the adoption of the two regulations, uh, one on medical devices and one on in vitro diagnostics. You will see here uh, also some of the uh, changes that had to be done as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, the, the postponement uh, of the date of application was very much necessary at the time to allow everyone to focus on their uh, urgent activities of having critical products on the market. Um, another uh, important uh, um, time, uh, change during this timeline is the um, extended timeline for the in vitro diagnostic regulation, which Rob uh, presented on, so the transitional provisions, and most recently, the amendment to the medical device regulation, as well as the in vitro diagnostic one. Uh, which was published in the official journal on the 20th of March, 2023. I will focus on the latest change. So the amendment of the transitional provisions for the MDR. And what you see here on the screen is uh, an overview of the new timelines. Um, notably, uh, as you know, for custom made implantable class three devices, there's now of course the, the requirement to have a uh, quality management system in place. So that is very important because we also will, uh, will be engaging, well, notified bodies will need to be engaged uh, in this area for the first time. Um, on the 31st of December, 2027, that's when the transitional period for class three and class two B implantable uh, devices uh, will end. Uh, and then the, the latest one is on the 31st of December, 2028, which is the end of the transitional period for the remaining uh, lower, let's say, risk classes. What you see here is missing are actually the most important dates to keep in mind, especially for manufacturers, and to ensure that notified bodies have the time to process your applications. The uh, upcoming deadline is 26th of May, 2024, to actually lodge in an application with a notified body and to have in place an MDR quality management system. This is critical if you want to be transitioning uh, to the new regulations, as well as to make use uh, of the extended transitional provisions. And uh, importantly, by 26th of September, 2024, it's to have a written agreement and the transfer of, of appropriate surveillance to an MDR designated notified body. So uh, I, I always take the opportunity here for a little bit of a public service, and, uh, public service announcement Please do not wait until the last minute for the sake of everyone, for the sake of notified bodies which are processing your applications. 
There will be questions, the backs and forth, this is expected. So don't expect to send in an application and it's just gonna go through uh, from the get-go. There's gonna be questions, a series of back and forth, so waiting until the last minute to apply or to lodge in an application is not gonna be helpful to anybody. On more positive news, uh, facilitating the transition to MDR and IVDR, we're very happy to see the increase uh, of notified bodies. We are now up to 50 under both regulations, 39 under the MDR and 11 under the IVDR. Actually, two more uh, have been approved uh, at the last medical device coordination group, so we hope to see those notifications in our uh, database for notified bodies called NANDO. Um, another very important activity to, to bring to your attention uh, is, um, well, a position paper, which has a series of activities with that both uh, competent authorities, notified bodies, and manufacturers are jointly working on this together, and I will get into that here on this slide. So I picked out some uh, of those activities, some of the priority areas that were identified by the MDCG, the Notified Body Coordination Group, um, and manufacturers, we jointly put these uh, priorities together. And uh, I'll take a moment, the MDCG is the Medical Device Coordination Group, uh, just to explain, which is mandated by our law for all responsibilities related to medical device and in vitro diagnostic regulations. So um, today I will focus on a couple of these priority areas, um, uh, making use of hybrid audits, I'll tackle it at the end of my presentation. Making standard fees publicly available is a very important activity uh, for the commission as well. Um, notified body capacity uh, for SME manufacturers. For us, SMEs are uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, and uh, of course, is to continue the structure, structured dialogue before and during the conformity assessment process in order to facilitate, let's say, timely certification. So I'm going to skip through some of these slides for the sake of time, but I believe they will be circulated after the meeting. Um, one of the key priorities that we've had, at least since 2020, is to continue to monitor how the transition is actually happening on the ground. Uh, a series of surveys to all notified bodies and manufacturers. Uh, we know that they have a, a bit of a survey exhaustion, but this is really important for us because we need to know where the issues are in order for us to take action where necessary. So the data that uh, I will be presenting today is the latest that we have. Um, uh, under the directives, MDD and uh, AIMDD certificates, the total that we have uh, under the directives are 22,793, so let's say 23,000. So this is, let's just take it as a baseline because we're gonna need to compare it with the new numbers uh, under the regulations. This is some of the more positive change that we've seen, especially uh, following the uh, amendment of the transitional provisions. So we're seeing more and more applications being lodged. Uh, most recently, uh, you can see the jump going up to 13,000 applications uh, that have been submitted. Uh, certificates, the number of certificates issued is also going up. We're currently at uh, nearly 4,000, 3,899. And uh, with this projection, uh, we hope to, to see the numbers increase even more in one year's time. And I'll explain that in, future in the next slide. Um, with these numbers, uh, I mentioned it, I believe, yesterday. We currently know that there have been around 9,000 uh, QMS applications submitted to the notified bodies, and uh, 2,682 uh, of them have been issued as of June 2023. Um, what you see on the right-hand side is actually the product application and certificates issued. Uh, as for us, notified bodies are responsible for both the QMS certificates and uh, the, tech, the uh, product applications or product certificates. These are some, uh, interesting, uh, some interesting data about why some applications are being refused by notified bodies, which is def de definitely some food for thought for manufacturers. Uh, check 
the notified bodies designation code maybe because it seems to be that 47 percent uh, of the refused application are actually because uh, it's outside the scope of a notified body's competence. So be before starting this entire process, I think it's always uh, important to check the NBOC codes. Um, uh, other, uh, the more concerning part for us is that the applications are 27% are considered not complete. So this is resulting in a lot of back and forths and a lot of discussions, a lot of questions, which is inevitably uh, causing some delays in issuing the certificate. Um, these are some numbers on how long it's taking to reach a new certificate. Of course, new regulations, new requirements, uh, many more requirements than what we had under the directives. So it's certainly taking longer to go through the process. Um, we are hearing reports that the, uh, the steep learning curve is uh, a bit getting easier to handle. So uh, it's taking up to six to 12 months to issue a new QMS certificate for 45% of the notified bodies that have been surveyed. Um, and for 39% of notified bodies, it's actually taking longer than 13 months. But we hope to continue to see those timelines go down as everyone gets more experience with the new system. With this, I take you back to my earlier slide, now that we know the timeline. So we're up to 3,899 uh, issued certificates at this point in time. So if I take the six to 12 months uh, estimation, we hope that by uh, June next year, we will actually uh, see those 13,177 issued, if not more. On NobleCap, uh, it is a, a huge project which is uh, focused on notified body and conformity assessment, assessment body staff development, as well as market operators staff uh, development. We know that there's uh, a significant, let's say sometimes uh, resource issue, expertise, lack of expertise in our sector. We want to facilitate, let's say, the growth of regulatory affairs for medical devices, auditing and inspectors. So we're working with uh, a large number of, uh, let's say, interested partners that have signed up to this, um, who, uh, and especially universities who are create, will be helping us create programs, uh, development of trainings for short and long term uh, for notified bodies, as well as for experts outside the field in order to engage uh, in medical device certification in the future. So with this, some of the expected project uh, output, uh, I think I already tackled the short and long-term training aspects. Uh, there will also, as apologies, will be a matchmaking platform, uh, which is intended to uh, connect market operators with um, the uh, available notified bodies based on their designation code, et cetera, and based on their availabilities, and the creation of a community of clusters clusters and innovation hubs uh, with uh, active partners in the field. So I, I will stop here. These are some of the main uh, activities that are um, expected under this project. Some of it has already uh, begun. Um, one important part is that there will be a dedicated job board. Uh, this is will also work in the, in the form of some horizon scanning as well looking into our market, looking into future developments uh, in the medical device field, trying to identify what future tech skills will be necessary for uh, operators that will be functioning in our market and experts working for notified bodies, and for uh, the development uh, and forming the content of the trainings themselves so the job board will be responsible for overseeing these activities. Um, on the track for notified body trainings, uh, the universities and all of the partners will be working together to create accredited courses, so both short and long-term courses um, that could be used uh, in order to increase capacity and expertise uh, in, uh, in the areas, as well as market operator training, uh, so courses specific to market operators, mostly focused on new requirements uh, that are foreseen in our regulation and specifically the clinical requirements, which we believe are some of the areas where manufacturers are struggling. And as for the platform, we don't have a lot of information yet. What we have is the design uh, idea for it. So 
It's supposed to support and matching certification demand and notified body availability, and to have this community of uh, innovative uh, innovation hubs and clusters. For transparency on notified body fees, I just wanted to specifically bring this to, to everyone's attention because it's one of the latest publications of the Medical Device Coordination Group um, from uh, our notified body specific uh, focus area. So our regulation now mandates that uh, the fees that are um, necessary in conformity assessment activities uh, should be made publicly available. So we, ha we have standardized now how to see uh, and oversee the, um, the different uh, fees uh, structure of notified bodies. And we've provided a template that would need to be uh, filled and available on the notified bodies websites uh, according to this information. So it could be easily comparable between different notified bodies. Finally, on uh, MDSAP, so what we have is existing, uh, existing reg uh, recognition and alignment and what are our ambitions and future proposed activities from the commission side. Uh, on existing recognition, you might be aware of the Medical Device Coordination Group guidance on uh, making use of MDSAP audit reports in the context of our uh, annual surveillance audits uh, under the MDR and IVDR otherwise known as MDCG 2020-14. It's a very long title. Um, you know that the, probably know that the scope of this recognition is currently limited to those surveillance audits and to help notified bodies in framing their annual surveillance audits, especially when the requirements are identical to the ones uh, in the MDR. Um, and with that, uh, we've been speaking also with notified bodies since the publication of this guidance uh, three years ago to see how it's being implemented on the ground. Um, I think one of the questions that I had a couple of days ago is that I would really uh, appreciate understanding on the how these uh, joint audits uh, are being conducted and how many of them are resulting in both an MDSAP certificate and an EU certificate, because those numbers will actually really help us assess how to move on in the future. Uh, another area that we would really uh, appreciate uh, some joint work with notified bodies and auditing organizations is the completion of the task uh, of the correlation table. So what you see here is what exists currently in our guidance uh, column for the MDR requirements, what is already covered by the MDSAP audit report, and what specific MDR requirements uh, are not currently, let's say, covered uh, under MDSAP or ISO 13485. So I know that we are doing our own exercise, but it would really be appreciated to do some peer review. We know that notified bodies slash auditing organizations probably already have versions of this mapping. So just to, to basically work together to see if we can find out all of these details and figure out how to move on to the next steps, uh, which I will tackle in the, in the later uh, slides. On hybrid audits, we also discussed it briefly yesterday. We had a number of exchanges uh, on uh, the definition of hybrid audits with the uh, MDSAP regulatory authorities, and the result has been, uh, from what I have understood, is a convergence in our approach, at least for the time being. I understood yesterday that it's currently in a pilot phase in, the, in MDSAP. Uh, actually, in the EU, uh, it's now recommended uh, to be utilized in, in, in a various uh, areas. And the notified body coordination group has been mandated to actually create a mapping of which areas could be completely uh, be conducted remotely and what uh, can be audited in a hybrid form. For the future, um, as I mentioned earlier, we are really looking forward to completing this kind of extensive mapping between uh, ISO 13485, uh, what currently exists in MDSAP uh, audit reports, and the MDR, IVDR, possibly also requirements in order to, to figure out, let's say, our next steps. The medical device coordination group uh, subgroup responsible for international matters is the one that's mandated to oversee uh, the EU's role in uh, MDSAP. 
So that there is an appetite to restart this work, but in order to do so, we would really appreciate you know, the feedback from yourselves. You're involved in these audits. You have these correlation tables, so we don't necessarily have to start from scratch. So it would be great to see if there's an appetite to work together on this. And of course, based on that, we have to take everything back to the member states and to see and assess the EU's existing role and future participation in MDSAP. Sorry if I ran over time, but I had a lot to update on. So thank you. Thank you very much, Nada. So uh, we have some time for questions for MHRA and EU. Thank you, Kenichi san, indeed. So uh, from the Commission side, if you're familiar with the European sometimes complicated process, the Commission can propose activities, but we of course have to get the consensus of our 27 member states. So for, from our side, we are starting these mapping activities. We're starting um, to, to look at different aspects. We want to see if we can manage to engage member states also to, to become more active uh, in MDSAP. So we hope that uh, with time, uh, we can come back with a more concrete response on our future role. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> any more questions? Yeah, I wanted to ask one. Uh, you alluded to the um, these guidelines uh, on the use of MD SAP report in the context of your, and you said a survey was uh, performed to see how the whether the notified bodies had used it or did you did you say something like that and and what was the outcome or i can ask the question to the auditing organizations if they know no, thank you um, uh, no indeed we have not launched the survey yet but okay. what we would like to take away from the mdsap forum as part of the discussions that we had two days ago is if we can actually go and look into those numbers that we've uh, spoken about and to see how many of those audits are being done for, I believe, initial certification, recertification, or surveillance, to see the breakdown, and uh, from that to understand how many of them are being conducted already as joint audits. And I believe my third question was how much additional auditing time is required for MDR-specific requirements, so just that we can maybe gather a more comprehensive uh, picture on the matter. Uh, yes, I think that Nada is referring to the action items that we have uh, discussed yesterday. So uh, I think this information uh, that we expect from the EOs will be very useful to, to work together with the uh, European Union. We still have some time, so if you have more questions, feel free. Uh, 
Okay, so if we don't have any more questions, we will move forward for the next presentation. It will be from Amat, Argentina. So unfortunately, uh, they were not able to, to come here, but they sent us uh, one recorded presentation, then we will show you in a minute. Thank you so much for your attention. This presentation is about Argentina's AMAT participation in MTSAP. This first slide is to show you AMAT's organizational structure. It is made up of three institutes, the National Institute of Drugs, the National Institute of Food, and the National Institute of Medical Devices. Also within each of them are offices that contribute to the daily tasks of our institution. Here we can see in further detail the structure of the National Institute of Medical Devices, which is led by Dr. Marcela Rizzo. It has three offices that lay the regulatory basis of these institutes. They are the Office of Monitoring and Risk Management of Establishments, under which are two departments. One of them is engaged in the monitoring and control of establishments, and the other one in the authorization for marketing and use of medical devices. Also, we have uh, the Office of Evaluation and Registration of Medical Devices, and under it, there are three departments that concern the registration of medical devices, innovative technologies, and in vitro diagnostic products. And finally, we have the Office of Post-Market Surveillance and Regulatory Actions, under which are two departments engaged in the post-marketing technovigilance and monitoring. This is the MET's regulatory framework. As we can see, we operate based on a pre-market stage, that is, when companies are licensed some products registered. And also, we operate on the basis of a post-market surveillance stage, that is, when product performance on the market is evaluated. Both stages are required to be included in companies' quality systems and their compliance is checked upon inspections. In this slide, we make reference to the regulations that govern inspections in Argentina. And MAT Regulation 3266 of the year 2012 allows for licensing medical devices manufacturers and importers. Even though it is a Mercosur ruling, it is based on ISO 13485 and provides for regulatory requirements. Distributors licensing regulation evaluates compliance with the good practices concerning storage, distribution and transportation of medical devices. This slide shows the three existing mechanisms used for inspections abroad. In the first case, we have companies based in our country and which operate under a system similar to that of NMAT or with higher requirements. In this case, we use Freelance, that is to say, we register products based on the certificate of free sale issued by the health authority on which we rely. Now, in the second case, we have companies based in any of Mercosur countries, that is Brazil, Paraguay or Uruguay. And here, in this case, inspections are governed by Mercosur Resolution 20 of the year 2017, which establishes that inspections records are to be exchanged among members. If the record results are compliant, a GMP certificate is issued for the foreign company. Last, in the third case, 
we have companies based in Argentina and which do not belong to any of the previous groups. And here, Enmat conducts on-site inspections in the company's country as per Enmat regulatory requirements. It is for the last case explained in the previous slide that we are currently using MDSAP. How has MDSAP program been used to date? The pandemic urged EDMAT to face and provide new solutions to the licensing of companies based abroad. This is why, as per an administrative decision, companies abroad are allowed to submit an MDSAP or an ISO 13485 certificate. Being an MDSAP member, a solution was found to the challenges posed at such time. And to date, some MDSAP certificates have been assessed unauthorized. Now we'll tell you about what we have done as members in the region. We have held meetings with the regulatory agencies from other countries intending to apply for affiliate membership. We told them about our experiences and uh, we expressed our willingness to accompany them on their pathway to their objective. Also, we held meetings with companies seeking to become an empty sub auditing organization and provided them with information as regards both the implementation in our country and abroad. We have also held meetings with stakeholders in order to boost the strengthening provided by MDSAP in respect of exports. We spread the benefits of participating in this program to other government bodies and sectorial chambers. And we can mention a workshop on exportable supply that is conducted within the sphere of the area of commercial intelligence of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Trade and Warship along with the Ministry of Productive Development and the Agency of Investments to support the national industry in terms of export capacity enhancing. And MAT is actively involved to provide the regulated sector with an updated regulatory framework. Ever since becoming an affiliate member to this program, MAT has turned into its promoter in the region. We spread the news to other agencies I highlight the benefits of this program, such as human resources optimization, but however, we point out that no sovereignty is lost by any agency at all. And what can we offer to MDSAP? We can provide technical transfer to the countries in the region. We provide experience and know-how in medical devices regulation which includes our involvement in international initiatives. For example, the Regional Working Group on Medical Device Regulation in the Americas of the Pan American Health Organization, where we are inviting other agencies to participate for regulatory convergence. And also Mercosur Subcommittee of Medical Devices. And here are the benefits that we find from MDSAP. Sovereignty of the regulatory authority to decide how to use MDSAP audit results. Also resource optimization for audits across the world. Reliance among health authorities. And a reduced burden of economic and human resources for manufacturers, as well as auditing common criteria. In addition to the previous benefits, we can mention a standardized qualification system, the absence of restrictions as to manufacturer geographical location, the information and updating from auditing organizations, the interaction and identification of ISO 13485 applying authorities, and also the possibility of rethinking the inspection scheme. MDSAP is always on NMAT's working agenda through the exchange among its National Institute of Medical Devices, the Sectorial Chambers, and the Secretariat of Production. This is the updated status. To date, two manufacturers hold valid certificates.
One company holds an inactive certificate, as it has not renewed its certification yet. Five companies have expressed their interest and intention to become MTSOP certified. The boundaries companies have reported on the path to become a certified concern costs of implementation. And last but not least are the challenges we face. Among them are to cooperate in the program processes of interest and involve other countries in the region, to promote participation of regulatory convergence and harmonization in a sustainable, strategic and efficient manner, to participate on an ongoing basis in MTSAP to share the medium and long-term tangible results stemming from program membership, and also to become a full member. Thank you again for your attention. Okay, so I would like to thank you, our colleagues from Argentina that are online. Um, next, we have another presentation that we have recorded. So, unfortunately, for security reasons, it was not possible to Israel to participate here in a face-to-face -face meeting. But we really appreciate that you took your time to, to send us the presentation. So. We will start next presentation. Thank you again, uh, our colleagues from Israel, Ministry of Health of Israel.